Hi, Terry. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Dave? I'm well. We seem to have lost David, and uh, we seem to be stuck with on the same screen here with the warm-up, so I hope everything is okay. <laughs> Scott vanished, too. Scott vanished, and David uh, fell off with his video. <laughs> there, oh. we go. there he is. <laughs> we can't hear you, Scott. Yes. <laughs> How about that? Here we go. You hear me now? That's it's like good. Scott Roberts now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to hide behind my screen again here. <laughs> well, at least we know he's there. Yeah. Y'all set for Thanksgiving? Yeah, everything is uh, quite good here in Wisconsin because we have the arrival of uh, twin girls in the family, my son and his wife. Oh, creamy. Mm -hmm. so they're still going to be in the uh, NICU for another uh, three weeks or so, probably, but they're doing fine and, and looking good and they're tiny, but they're growing. And mm -hmm. so everything's good there. Well, that's great. That sounds exciting for the holidays. Yeah, another generation of Iker girls yeah. here. Yep. Definitely. Wow. Have you had any snow yet? No, no snow, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we had sort of, you know, little bits of it in the sky, but nothing that's stuck at all, really. Yeah, we had some snow flurries, but nothing that's stuck on the ground. Kind of gets me in a Christmas spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it won't be long. We'll be getting a deluge, probably. Yeah. How's everything going back in the homeland, though, these days, Terry? 
pretty good. It's dry, just yeah. like every place else, I think. Yeah. Uh, wind blows all the time. All of our pretty leaves have blown off the trees almost. Wow. Yeah. But uh, it's actually, I was just in Oxford a couple weeks ago. Wow. Looking around down at Houston Woods. Yeah. That's a nice, uh, a visually stunning area there. It is. It really is. I was at Houston Woods before all the leaves blew off the tree or, you know, there was still quite a bit of color. It was beautiful. Oh, down by the lake. Perfect time to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Actually, that's where I'm spending Thanksgiving. Uh, wow. Yeah. Family's getting together. So we're going to be down there. Oh, nice. Well, that should be fun. Well, I hope the weather is nice for you there. Yeah, me too. You know, I don't mind a little snow, though. I'm kind of, I can... I don't know. It just fits the holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, excellent. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, when is the two, uh, Tucson Rock and Mineral, the big show that they do in Tucson? Tucson Gem Show, Gem and Mineral Show. It's the biggest uh, show of collectors of that kind of stuff in the world. There's also another very big show in Munich each year, but it's not quite as big as the Tucson Show. So it's the Tucson show, generally speaking, is, you know, three or four hundred dealers and it's kind of spread out at various hotels and other places. It kind of migrates around a little bit as the hotels evolve and and either gain or lose quality, you know, but it happens every February. We're actually throwing a star party. The magazine does at the same time as the show. Oh, um, really? Mid-February. Yeah. So that we can be there at the same time and look at some star, you know, hope there's a lot of crossover with the people who are interested in rocks and minerals and meteorites too, of, you know, doing things at, at night uh, and getting the astronomers to be interested in the rocks and minerals during the day a little bit. Yeah. My dad was a rock hound. He used to go to Montana and bring, he would go with another uh, couple. They would bring home baskets of Montana agate. Wow. And they would make beautiful jewelry. So okay. I think some of that has kind of rubbed off on me. <laughs> sure. And that's good stuff. That's fun stuff to have. Yeah, that agate from that area. Yeah. 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 I found myself up on Lake Superior looking for agates on the beach. I spent time walking on the beach. Yeah, that that's a good collecting spot too. Yes, indeed. Yeah. For the yeah, but you'd go, you know, it's you're dizzy. I mean, if you go through Tucson, you know, three or four or five days in a row and you look, you know, from the mid morning to late afternoon, you know, you, after a couple of days of that, you're just dizzy. You know, you've looked at a hundred thousand specimens, you know, and it's yeah. can be overwhelming sort of, you know, but it's fun. Yeah, I bet so. so. Hi, David. Hello, Our Terry. I'm back. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been in Tucson when the show was going on. Um, but not at a time when I could stop. I was driving through on my way up to Flag, and yeah. I couldn't stop. <laughs> so, well, it's you know, remember what they say about the Tucson Gem Show. If you if you want to have that collector mentality that I'm infected with, certainly, and many of us are, bring all the money you can and more. <laughs> 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 i bet i am going to make a point to be able to go out there at the same time when i really can stop at the show and look around there's a show um here in ohio saturday that i'm gonna go to nice. so not yeah. near as big as what that is but yeah just a nice little show sure. um, it's yeah. big enough to have some interesting things that's all that counts yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. yeah cool yeah I went, actually, I went to one in Indiana probably two months ago, and it was really nice. It was a bigger association, and nice. it was it was at a fairground and covered like three huge buildings. Wow. Yeah, I had fun at that one. <laughs> I found cool. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good size. And, and after all this stuff, you know, it's planetary geology, this stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And I love looking at the old dinosaur, you know, dinosaur yeah. bones that are fossilized. I mean, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the fossil area is another huge adjunct to all of this at Tucson as well. And they have, you know, everything from, you know, for both rocks and minerals and fossils, you know, there's everything, you know, from a $2 specimen for kids all the way up to, you know, million dollar pieces for museums, you know, right there on the spot. Yeah. When you guys got into fossils, I thought you guys were talking about me. 
<laughs> I hear a voice. <laughs> well, we have um, we have some old friends here uh, already watching. Norm Hughes is watching out of Tulsa. Harold Locke. Uh, howdy, Norm and Scott, and the great star people on the panel. Osmosis 007, howdy, internet peoples. And David Ng. Uh, Dave was on Global Star Party a long time ago. He should come back sometime. He says hello, everybody. So we're getting started and, you know, or restarted with our great tradition of the Global Star Party. Scott, when was the date of the last one? Was it August 25th? Yeah, it sure was. That's what I thought. That's where exactly I started. Exactly what it at. was. Yeah. yeah. It's weird that this is August 20, or October 25th. Yeah. I did not plan that. <laughs> I thought maybe you did. <laughs> yeah. Kareem Jaffer is watching. Um, he unfortunately couldn't be on tonight, but... Uh, I'm glad he's uh, listening, and and uh, his son is going to be on uh, Global Star Party tonight, giving a presentation about his uh, spectroscopic wor work at Mount Wilson Observatory. Hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I guess it's time to get started here. using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope have found a jet propelled through space at nearly the speed of light by the titanic collision between two neutron stars, which are the collapsed cores of massive supergiant stars. The explosive event observed on August 17, 2017, was the first combined detection of gravitational waves and gamma radiation from the merger of binary neutron stars. This discovery prompted scientists to quickly aim Hubble at the site of the explosion. A total of 70 observatories around the globe and in space collectively gathered data across the electromagnetic spectrum of the merger's aftermath. Astronomers used Hubble's capabilities to precisely measure the position and movements of the explosion's shockwave. They were trying to see how the shockwave's physical <coughs> properties changed over time. Combining Hubble observations with that of several other telescopes allowed researchers to pinpoint the explosion site 130 million light years away. The data suggests the blast shock waves traveled along a narrow beam confined by powerful magnetic fields. The resulting jet smashed into and swept up material in the surrounding interstellar medium. This material included a mass radiation through which the jet emerged. As the jet moved away from the site of the explosion, the mass moved outward. This work paves the way for more precise studies of neutron star mergers. More observations like this one help us understand more about the universe. Well, hello everybody. It has been a long time, a couple months, I think, since we've had a, um, a regular global star party. Um, I have been running uh, halfway around the world uh, doing events such as the Starmus event in Armenia. I came back just to change suitcases and then I went to, um, I went to Arizona, uh, to Oracle, Arizona for the uh, David H. Levy uh, Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. Um, and uh, combined with that was the entire community of Oracle who decided to celebrate their dark sky heritage and uh, have celebrations at restaurants and bars uh, in the area. It was a lot of fun. We did have some thunderstorms in the evening and even into the late evening, but almost every night it did clear off. Saturday was the coup de grace though. We had uh, clear skies all the way through and um, uh, we had a live uh, live bands uh, music that was you know inspired by my uh, interaction at Starmus, uh, understanding that uh, music and astronomy really can go hand in hand, and um, uh, it was uh, it was a fabulous night. They so many people came to Oracle State Park that they had to 
sadly turn some people away. Um, but uh, uh, it just gives us encouragement to do it bigger and better next year. Um, so, uh, and then from, from that point, I uh, came back, changed suitcases again, and went straight out to Mount Wilson Observatory, where we had the 60-inch star party. Um, and we just had a fabulous tour by uh, Tom Meneghini and Chris Burns uh, of Carnegie. And, uh, you know, a new group of people got to learn all about the history of, uh, that was made at Mount Wilson. So, you'll have to join us on one of these trips uh, here in the future. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have uh, David Levy here with us, uh, and uh, he will kick this 104th Global Star Party crossing uh, uh, the Great Divide. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, that whole theme is kind of metaphorical in, in the way that, uh, you know, scientists and even amateur scientists are crossing the great divide of the unknown, you know, to try to figure out where we are in the universe and, you know, our relationship to it. But also, uh, it is, uh, uh, for amateur astronomers especially, uh, in the way that we cross the great divide, in the differences between people. Uh, astronomy is one of those uh, uh, things, especially amateur astronomy, is one of those things that, you uh, bring people together and makes us make us all realize that we're all connected somehow. And uh, so, but uh, I'm going to turn this over to David Levy. David, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. Thank you. And this is the 104th. I think I've attended 103 of the 104. Well, we added an extra one. So this is a, this is still technically for you 104. <laughs> so it's still 104. It's still one. Okay, so I have an unbroken record somehow. That's right. <clears throat> I have to tell you that a lot has happened in the two months that we haven't had the star parties. And uh, the most important thing is that Wendy, <clears throat> Wendy died on the 23rd of September, which would have, which was the night, the one night I was at the um, Oracle Star Party, the Star Party in Arizona. And we were observing together. I had given her a big hug earlier that, later that afternoon and then went up to the Star Party and she passed away, leaving a very bright meteor that we could all see that night as her way of saying goodbye. I have two quotations today. One of them is in memory of Wendy and it is, um, the other one is, a happier one from Lord Byron. So the one for Wendy is from Macbeth, and it's also from uh, the end of Hamlet. And I think some of you might have heard that. King Charles III said that uh, on the loss of his mom <coughs> back then. <coughs> and uh, and uh, that was only about three weeks or so before I lost my Wendy. And here goes the first quote. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day over 30 wonderful, unforgettable years to the last syllable of recorded time. Life is so much more than a walking shadow of friends who struts and frets their hours across the stage and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. It is a tale told by an idiot and it is a tale told by a genius, full of sound and light, signifying so, so much. Now cracks a noble heart, good night, sweet Wendy, and may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And now comes the happier of the two quotations. This is from George Gordon Lord Byron's from Manfred, and one line has been added to it. When the moon is on the wave, and the glowworm in the grass, and the meteor on the grave, and the wisp in the morass. When the falling stars are shooting, and the answered owls are hooting, and the silent leaves are still in the shadow of the hill, shall thy soul, shall my soul be upon thine, with a power and with a sign. And tonight we go out to observe online. Thank you, Scott, and back to you. I like that ending. Um, David, I, um, uh, what, uh, what people did not see um, 
uh, in the um, behind the curtain of uh, the Global Star Party was uh, uh, some happy news that uh, David was able to share with us. I, I do want to say that uh, uh, before we go to this, that uh, you know our 104th Global Star Party is uh, you know is dedicated to the memory of Wendy Levy, uh, who was uh, uh, a great um, a great person to uh, encourage David to uh, work through uh, trials and tribulations that he had, and uh, to inspire. Uh, all of us, so um, it's really wonderful. When I was at the Carolyn Shoemaker tribute uh, at Lowell Observatory, a topic of discussion was uh, where was the missing uh, original plates for the com for Comet Shoemaker Levy uh, that uh, David and uh, Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker discovered together, um, and apparently. Uh, they have been found. Can you give us a little backstory on that, David? Yeah, they have been found. Um, they were found by Patrick Shoemaker, who was doing the final cleaning out of Carolyn's house. And he was in the basement looking in the filing cabinet, and there he found this, this envelope. And wow. it says that there are two comets. One of them is Comet Faye. Um, and then the other one is Discovery Films, original Discovery Films of Comet Shoemaker 89. And I have one of them here. The other one is on a transparency. Oh, wow. Just kind of showing it to you there. Yeah. This is like and, holding the Rosetta Stone or something. It's kind of like holding the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> I don't know yet where they're finally going to end up, um, but I'm suspecting they will either go to the Smithsonian or to the Linda Hall Library, hmm. depending on which organization is prepared to give them a better display. But um, I don't know if I don't mind bragging a little bit. That yeah. These are two of the most important photographic films, I believe, ever taken. And uh, I'm so glad that they were recovered just before the house was broken up and sold. Yeah, just absolutely. before everything would have been tossed in the trash. Yeah. I'm so glad that this was this these films were recovered. I, I would certainly rank these films uh, in order of importance along with uh, the uh, discovery of the uh, variable star in M31 with, uh, from Edwin Hubble and um, perhaps maybe one of the first images of a star or nebula or the moon ever made. Um, so this is uh, just to kind of have it in your home and to be holding it uh, is really <laughs> amazing in itself. So, um, but I'm sure we'll find a, a good place uh, where you know, people throughout, uh, throughout the future will be able to uh, check this out. So uh, very important. Um, one of the things one of the things that I uh, remember regarding these films is that when, when it was, the announcement came from the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams that the comet was going to co probably collide with Jupiter, um, and uh, the three of us were sitting in the observatory in the bottom floor of the 18-inch, and we're just looking at the films again, and we weren't talking very much. It was really pretty quiet that afternoon as the three of us were trying to understand the importance of what we were reading yeah. and what we were being told. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to absorb all of that. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, David. Thank you. It's really cool. Okay. All right. So we are going to transition uh, now to uh, Terry Mann from the Astronomical League. Uh, she's going to share, of course, the Astronomical League is, is, is an organization that we uh, greatly support um, in, in all the ways that we can, um, from the underwriting of the National Young Astronomers Award and the Leslie Peltier Award, and now, um, and now the uh, Wilhelmina Fleming Award for Women in Astrophotography. Um, 
But, uh, you know, it's a wonderful organization to join. Um, if your club is a league club, then you're kind of automatically joining. Um, but uh, if you're somewhere in the world and you support what the league does and all of its observing programs and all the awards and things that it does to support and uh, uh, encourage people to look up and uh, explore, um, you can join the Astronomical League as a member at large. And I know s lots of people that uh, watch this program have done just that. So, um, but I'm going to turn it over to you, Terry. Thank you for coming on to uh, the 104th Global Star Party. I know that you've been also running all over the place. And uh, uh, so it's nice to have you here with us. And um, I'll let you take it away. Okay. Thank you, Scott. I hope I remember how to do this. It's been so long <laughs> since I've been on here. I have yep. to stop and think. That's I the reason why I do them every week, so I actually remember how to do yeah, it. Yeah, so. it's like, what was last week, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah, so thank you. It is a pleasure to be here to see everybody again and uh, just to kind of catch up. So I am going to ask the um, the questions. Once I remember how to do this, I started that wrong. Let's see, there we go. And uh, we'll see if, there we go. We always talk about observing the sun and being very careful and make sure you have the right filters. Um, and if you've never observed the sun, always try to find a club or somebody that is very familiar with observing the sun. So they can help you learn how to find the sun in the telescope if you don't have a go-to mount or however you're going to use it, or binoculars, especially we've got the two, the 2023 annular eclipse coming up in October, and then we'll have the total eclipse coming up in April of 24. So we've really got some cool sun stuff coming up and hopefully a lot of Aurora with all the sunspots we have seen on the sun. So. Before you look at the sun, have a good idea um, of what you're doing or ask for help because the sun can do some damage if you don't prepare correctly. All right, the answer is from August 25th. It took me a little while to get back to all my answers and the people that answered the questions correctly. So the first question was, for observers in mid-northern latitudes, what well-known asterism is found centered at the zenith when darkness falls late August and early September? And the answer is the summer triangle. Next question, what planet is closest to Earth on August 25th? And that was Mercury. And the last question is, which moon is most massive? And that would be Jupiter's Ganymede. So these are the people that answered the questions correct, correctly that I put on the list. So it would be Cameron Gillis, Bill Manley, Adrian Bradley, Don Knapp, Barbara Brown, and Andrew Corkhill. So for October 25th questions, what two planets did the moon occult in October? So what plant, two planets did the moon occult in October? And please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. On a moonless night under dark skies, can Jupiter cast a shadow? Is that true or false? I guess it shouldn't have been a question. This is true or false. <laughs> so can it cast a shadow, yes or no? And again, please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And the final question, what was the name of the first comet ever discovered? What was the name of the first comet ever discovered? We, and we, we will give the We can't answer. let David answer that because- Yeah, I'm don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> Not online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will give the answers on the first um, star party of every month. The winners will be announced. And also, we need all answers. Some people don't answer these questions until they've watched it maybe in a day or two. But we need all of the answers in 
by the Friday after the GSP. Anything received after that, we're already in process and cannot be done. So again, please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And Scott, I think we talked about a little bit. I was going to go in and talk yeah. just a little bit. Oh, wait a minute. Let me do the more important one. Oh, yeah. This is, this is going to oh, be fun. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a blast. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. We have got amazing speakers. Uh, Astronomical League Live is this Friday, and we're having another Halloween party. We did it last year and Ooh. people loved it. And so this year we're doing it again. So again, we will have Carol Ord, which is a president of the league and he'll be doing an update. We've got David Levy and his celestial incantations. And Barbara Harris uh, at this point might not be there. Um, she contacted me today and said she didn't think she was going to make it, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. We've got Scott Roberts that's actually going to give a talk. And it's going mm -hmm. to be a good one. I've heard the story. Mm -hmm. And right. it's spooky. hikers on November's Blood Red Moon. I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are. There's a lot going on with the eclipse. We have Ken, Kevin Schindler from Lowell Observatory. Tales from the Crypt. The stories about Percival Lowell's mausoleum. That ought to be good, too. Mary Stewart Adams. Dragons and Devils in the Night Sky. And we have Bob, Astro Bob, Bob King from Minnesota. It came from outer space. People and possessions hit by space rock, rocks. So each one of these people will be speaking anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes about their topic. And it, believe me, this is going to be good. <laughs> I am so looking forward to this one. Everybody has got such interesting mm. topics. Dave, I can't wait to hear about the eclipse. And David, you are always, always welcome. And it's such a pleasure to have on AL Live. And Scott, it's about time you got up and gave a story. Uh, I'm you know, scared, <laughs> which I should be on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> this time you're going to make an appearance. So please <laughs> join us this Friday, 7 mm -hmm. p.m. ED at Eastern Daylight Time. And you can watch us here on this channel or on the Astronomical League Facebook page, whichever place. And it will be recorded, as always, so you can watch watch it anytime after. So, all right. Your topic was interesting to me because, you know, I do a lot of astrophotography. And there are, you know, there are us women are around that do this. But most of the time, you know, there's not as many as what there is male. But I tell you the connection and the, the actual camaraderie, camaraderie in astronomy is amazing. Our community is so easygoing, so willing to share information. Um, and just, it's a pleasure really to be in such a community where you can know so many people. But for me, I think being a woman out in astrophotography or night photography, and I actually have known men that will probably say this too. When you first start it, you go through an adjustment period, especially when you're alone. You can go and you scout during the day. I scout all the time during the day, wherever I'm at, where I want to shoot that night. But when you go back at night, it is a total different, the feel is all different. Everything's quiet. You hear the noises. At least I usually am way out in the middle of nowhere and secluded because I'm after the darkest skies. And that's what everybody goes after. If you're going to be imaging or visual, you want the darkest, clearest skies you can find. And I find myself in a lot of really cool places that if I was not doing this, maybe I wouldn't be there. Look at Starmus. Look at what these guys have done. They are seeing the world and they are bringing so much back to all of us. And with Scott doing broadcasting, it actually opens up the world even more. So, so many of us connect that way. We get over that division. But this is uh, this is actually Casper, Wyoming, setting up for the 2017 eclipse. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you know, you, when you're in this hobby and you see a view like this, we sit here and we say, it is amazing. But I'm telling you, it'll knock your socks off. Because being in the crowd the sounds, the people, the excitement, 
It is amazing when you're at a total solar eclipse. It'll be amazing to see the total lunar eclipse or the annular coming up in 2023. You don't forget it. I mean, I've only seen three total eclipses. Dave can outdo me by a long shot. But it's something I can tell you the picture from each one. I can tell you the feel and what happened from each one. And again, I bet every one of us here that has seen a total solar eclipse remembers so much about it. You don't forget this and you share that and it gets others excited. And now with 2024 coming up, people are coming out of the woodwork here where I li live. And, you know, I'm working with the parks people in my counties, with the libraries, doing talk, getting talks already lined up for next year and the following year to get ready for this because so many people will see the 2024. And Michael, a Bockage, Backage, I don't say his name. Backage. Bockage. Bockage. There we go. He gave, amazing, yeah, he gave an amazing talk at Alcon. Uh, I, was, I had a great time at Alcon. I listened to his talk and it inspired me even more. But, you know, it's just like um, spending the night at Arches. You know, during the day right now, I think, well, maybe you don't have to have reservations in October. I think it might have stopped at this point, but I'm not sure. Just going and shooting at night, trying to set up and do the type of shoots that you do. You know, like I said, when you first start this, there is a little bit of element of, ah, you know, you're out here in the middle of nowhere and you're alone and you hear the noises. I just actually, I just did a shot, uh, was in Colorado at Canyon of the Ancient shoot, shooting a couple months ago. And <laughs> the people were talking about, I was at a B and b in a ranch and they said they had a bear break into their honey. Okay, oh, wow. I'm out, <laughs> yeah, I'm out here hmm. at five o'clock in the morning and I hear something grunting in the woods and breathing heavy. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my gosh, the bear, you know, and I'm not about to take off because he's not threatening me. He's, you know, way far away, but there is that element of very much being aware of everything that's around you. Your spidey senses kick in, you know, you begin to be aware of the wind. You begin to be aware of lights, anything traveling. And eventually as you do this long enough, you get better at that, but you also relax more. I find that when I go into a shoot and I'm by myself and I'm really literally in the middle of nowhere, I, I sense a lot of things around me. And I also know when I pull into an area, if I don't feel right, and I even though I have no reason, I will not stay in that area. These are things I think as you do this, you get used to. And once you relax, you begin to see all these details. Um, such as, I think this is the three gossips at Arches, uh, uh, the Alaska Aurora. I spend many, many nights traveling the night skies in Alaska or night roads looking at the sky in Alaska alone. And, and it is spectacular. Um, you know, seeing the Earth's shadow just in different areas around the U.S., uh, Borrego Springs. Uh, it, it, it's just incredible. I would not see these sites if I didn't do these things. Uh, watching the Milky Way at the national parks just is an amazing opportunity. But what, the whole thing I think I'm trying to say is you begin to relax once you do this a lot. You see more. And actually, it's kind of like it's a very humbling kind of experience when you're standing under that dark Milky Way. Mm. When you're standing in a place like I saw Scott and, um, you know, the whole group out at the temple when you were doing the star party, that had to be amazing to be in such an old, old place. Yeah. And all of the people that were there, I mean, it had to be incredible. So to be able to just, do, oh, I bet, and share it. Um, you know, I, I went to Death Valley. I had wanted to go to the racetrack all at Death Valley, the Moving Rocks racetrack, all my life. And to actually spend the night at the racetrack imaging. And, and you know, I found myself, and the moon was up when I first got there. So I had a moon, I could do a lot of shots, and then it set. But standing in the middle of the racetrack was something was a bucket. Oh, yeah. Five. <laughs> We're going to blast off, right, Scott? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last half time. <laughs> and again, just the Aurora, just amazing stuff. But I tell you what, this is my last shot. I have never in my life seen this site before. Um, in May, I was in Island of the Sky National Park, and I was doing the arch of the Milky Way and the air glow. I have never seen this before. And I, I was totally amazed because it was like one arc over the other arc. And I, you know how you just see something you've never seen and you stand there in awe with your jaw on the ground saying, oh my gosh, what, what is that? I spent so much time there and you can see the air or the light pollution mountains kind of here in the background, but it was spectacular that, you know, and again, I'll never forget this evening. And I'm sure Adrian can, uh, can go along with this too. He knows exactly what I'm saying. I'll bet. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you go through a stage when you first started doing this? There is a little bit of a getting used to it stage that you, you do. Yes, there is. I can vouch completely for that because even as I do it now, every little sound that I hear, if I can't recognize what the sound is, I immediately put up my Dukes. So <laughs> it's the, uh, you're out there by yourself yeah. and you know, all of your fears run through your head. Now, the truth is, you know, that the animals, like you said, you talked about the bear. Um, the animals generally want no part of human beings. They're not going to engage unless something is wrong or, you know, something big. So you, you generally left alone. Um, you still do have to be aware of your surroundings but yeah. as you get used to it. As soon as you look up, like you've, you look at a scene like this before you even shoot it and it immediately calms your mind. Yeah. Um, so that's um, that is a part of doing what we do with the uh, nightscapes and um, you know, the landscape astrophotography, you're enjoying the beauty of the night sky and you're capturing it as you're seeing it. That becomes your focus and less, you know, if you, if animals and little things that go bump in the night scare you, you're going to need some time or you're going to have to go with a, go with a friend in order to <laughs> get yourself acclimated yes. to doing this. Yeah. It is not, it is not easy to trump through a dark wooded area alone right? with nothing but a headlamp and a tripod that you're holding <laughs> as a weapon. Um, as soon as you get to the <clears throat> other side where the sky opens up, and you're presented with an image like you're showing us, it makes it all worthwhile. And um, yeah, you you know, that's what we go for. Yeah. And, you know, I have found one strange thing. A lot of people like to sleep at night. Now, I can't figure this out. Mm, I mean, what is either. going on here? <laughs> I don't I don't get it. They're missing so much I mean, yeah. sleep. Look at I this. think sleep can be overrated at times. This this will. I won't use the term addiction because I think it's the wrong direction. I think passion yeah. is the uh, way that we see it. When you see beauty like this and in, in some of those dark places you go to, you know that you see it before you actually image it. And yeah. it really drives you to want to continue to not only capture it, but show others and say, you know, all the light that we throw up there you know, you're blocking your view of this. You know, this exactly. Is, this yeah, is, it, it brings light pollution home. It yeah. shows people that don't understand what light pollution might be or how it affects really dark skies or even city everywhere. It kind of brings it home. So I will quit talking and let you move on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Um, okay, uh, that was that was excellent. Our, uh, our next speaker is um, uh, David Eicher. David was with me, uh, or I was with him, at uh, the Starmus event in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really an amazing um, event, something like I've never been to before. Um, and I felt, uh, I felt it was a real honor uh, to be there. You know, I mean, there was so many Nobel laureates there. Uh, scientists that uh, you know that you've heard about but never had a chance to meet uh, much less just hang out with and talk to um, 
And, uh, you know, the, the entire presentation, the astounding music, the fusion of music that was there. This was not, you're not going to be able to buy the album uh, of music that was performed there. Um, which is sad because they should have, <laughs> they should have the uh, soundtrack to Starmus on, uh, you know, uh, for streaming or something. Um, uh, the star parties were incredible, uh, especially the public star party at what was called Camp Starmus. Uh, you know, they said something like a third of the population of Yerevan, Yerevan went through this. And at the time, I was the only guy there with a telescope. So uh, they were very, very curious <laughs> about the telescope, to say the least. Um, and we did get a nice peek at, uh, at Jupiter and Saturn uh, while we were there. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the hunger of, of uh, that uh, society, those people living there, to learn more about science was something that uh, uh, I don't think I've ever experienced before. Uh, so, uh, you, know, the, you know, we often talk about the transformative effect of, uh, of astronomy and astronomy being a gateway to science and uh, how things can make you more scientifically literate. But, uh, you know, when you have a young generation that is really starving for this and they're finally presented with it in such an amazing way, um, you know, it's, uh, it creates something that, uh, you know, you have to live through to, uh, to really understand. So, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for coming on to our 104th Global Star Party. Of course. Thanks, pal. And it was really a pleasure to have you there. And we really had fun. You know, there's nothing yeah, like it. And you're right. I mean, when you go to a place where people haven't experienced this kind of thing and the enthusiasm, the, oh. the you know, the energy from people was just incredible. And, and uh, it was a, a large number of people. We had, uh, you know, I think between four and 5,000 people there. And it was kind of the first event after which we came out of the pandemic and kind of had a normal event with all the old people together again. So I'm going to share my screen if I can. Yep. And uh, walk through some of this. I'll see if I can start a slideshow here as well. And can you see Freddie Mercury? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Then we're in the right place. And I thought I would just talk a little bit about Starmus. And Scott, you can certainly jump in if you'd like, having been uh, in, in the core of, of our inner circle there. Um, you know, it was essentially a week long event, but we had some other special events. Scott brought telescopes at great complexity. Of course, you can imagine shipping, I, I believe it was something like a dozen telescopes and getting them there on time on the ground in Armenia. And we had a remarkable star party. I'll show you an image of where it was at a 1900 year old Greco-Roman temple as a backdrop uh, with a band there and all kinds of things too. But it was quite remarkable. And we also had an astro imaging school that Scott and that my colleague, Michael Bakich were involved in running as well with a number of people there talking about imaging for several days. So it was Starmus with some additional stuff uh, put onto it this time. And I just kind of wanted to open with this image because there's a huge festival sort of opening night of all kinds of things that goes on. Uh, and we had an arena now with, you know, 5,000 people in it that was quite a different venue than yes. Starmuses of, of past days, I can tell you, you know, it, it's, it's become something uh, a lot more grand and large. Uh, in, in its presentation than it had been. But we had this incredible, uh, you know, just moment of, of this children's choir of Armenia from Yerevan coming out. And, and we also had uh, involvement from the National Symphony Orchestra of Armenia there as well. But we had Freddie, you know, up there synced doing some Queen tunes and he was singing and the kids were synced with kind of doing motions and singing along with Freddie. And I'll tell you, Scott, you were there with us, I think, yeah. in the front row as well. And when the kids were got to singing with Freddie, We Are the Champions, they yeah, were, yeah. were weeping there watching. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I don't, I don't care how uh, hardened uh, you are to uh, <laughs> things like this, but uh, we all had big knots in our throats. Um, the, the singing was, was amazing and the harmonics in the building were, were incredible. I mean, it is, uh, 
you know, this this building was uh, built for rock and roll. And um, but, uh, you know, th th this is part of the fusion of the music that that I was describing a little bit. Um, at one point, even the symphony orchestra and the children's uh, choir and, uh, you know, top performers all performing together, you know, it was just you know, I, I just wish that I did have, uh, you know, the album because it was just, it was, um, it really got to you. And, uh, and this is part of what really reinforces all the scientific information that you're hearing about, all the, um, you know, basically rubbing shoulders with some of the most brilliant minds in the world. Uh, you know, it was all right there, and uh, there were in the audience children, uh, parents, you know, grandparents, people of all ages were there, and uh, and they were all getting it, and it was uh, it was really incredible. It was quite remarkable, and as you know, Garrick Israelian is the founder and director of Starmus, along with Brian May, who's an astrophysicist, and he also has a day job. Um, he's a guitarist. Um, but but uh, they sort of founded it. And, and as Brian likes to say, you know, using both halves of your brain, you know, the analytical scientific uh, part and also the musical creative part, you know, and we certainly saw that here uh, at Starmus this time. So I thought I would just walk through a few highlights. Now, much to my surprise, uh, a few weeks before I left to go to Armenia, um, I was given the startling news that they had made me in possibly what was a backwards move in the in the progress of civilization. They've made me the president of the board of Starmus. Um, and in part, this was because I also found out when we arrived there, we were going in to give a report to the Armenian parliament about the status of Starmus, and that was because the government of Armenia funded a good part of it this time. It's a long story, but the past president was a physicist who, who uh, is no longer president, but was until last year. So he really was excited to have Starmus come there. Can you imagine a physicist running a country, you know? Um, and we right. had, you know, running Germany as well there, Angela Merkel as well. We're, we haven't quite gotten to scientists running the United States of America yet, but we'll see if we can work on that in the future. So anyway, to our surprise, we had to go in and testify to the army. This is like going into the Cannon office building, you know, adjacent to the Capitol and testifying about what we were going to do. I, I thought for all I knew, they'd made me the president of the board. I was going to spend the rest of my life in an Armenian jail. <laughs> but it worked out okay. So they were happy with what we said, and you know, it, it was fine, but that was quite an experience. Um, and we got to see, you know, Armenia, just the, the city of Yerevan and, and the country of Armenia going outside the, you know, it's a really wonderful modern yes. city. I would say there's about a 30 by 30 square block core of the city that's really nice and modern. And it seems like, you know, you could be. Yeah shops and you could be in a part of Manhattan in little areas of it and then you get outside of the city and their archaeological ruins and places to explore and it's very much you know uh, not quite as you know it's it's a it's a sort of an old world uh, place outside of the you know wonderful you know highly shine, shining you know spots of the inner city there um so it was really an interesting place to be. I'd never been there before. I, Scott, I don't think you had been there either. No, no. And I, I was really, I was really taken back. At um, here we are in a city of a million plus people. Um, crime in Yerevan is almost non-existent. Yes, uh, that was really a surprise. Um, the people that were, uh, you know, the 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 hosts and the people that were taking care of us from the organizational part of Starmus were uh, telling us, you know, the backstory of, you know, why this event was so amazing in Armenia, you know, and I had, you know, being an ignorant uh, uh, USA citizen, so to speak, uh, you know, certainly you hear things about some repressive um, uh, things that were going on. Uh, but uh, Armenia was, uh, of course, part of uh, the Soviet Union at one point, and um, uh, you know they they were definitely 
it, the average person would not have been able to go and study science, um, would not have been able to really use their imagination to create much, okay? Um, you know, and, and that was uh, to hear it from them and not to hear it from, you know, some something that I might have considered to be some sort of propagandist type of thing, but to really hear it from them, I would say uh, was... Uh, it def definitely had a profound effect on me, um, you know. And the other thing that, going back to how nonviolent uh, Yer Yerevan is, uh, um, they were talking about a murder that had occurred there seven years ago that they still talk about. Okay, um, I was thinking about living in the LA area and going, gosh, you know, murder seven years ago that that. that you know, murders happen every day in, in Los Angeles. So it was just, uh, I mean, it's just, if you're considering going someplace, you want, to, you want to see some beautiful architecture, meet some wonderful people, um, you know, I, I would highly recommend Yerevan, uh, and you will be absolutely safe. It's very safe, and, and the culture is very interesting, and it's an old culture in terms of interest in science. They're old astronomical observatories. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very old uh, um, nation when it comes to having adopted Christianity too. So they're very interesting sites to, to explore long before the Soviet Union came uh, walking along. And sure. came, But we should really give a shout out. We had an army of volunteers who kind of looked after and took care of us. And I have to give a shout out to Sammy because I never would have been in the right place anywhere at any time this whole week without her guidance and help. So we, we had a sort of a red carpet treatment of people who were assisting us. We right. gave many times at, at schools, going here, there, and everywhere, and it was organized just beautifully and perfectly, so it really worked out well. The head guy, um, although I'm the president of the board, I answer to this guy, uh, Garrick Israeli and is an astronomer in the Canary Islands. He's of Armenian heritage, and so there's a big connection going back to Armenia for Garrick to have Starmus there but he's uh, a Spanish citizen now working in the Canaries and, and he's an astronomer who's involved in all sorts of research and is the co-founder of Starmus. When Brian May went back to finish his PhD, which he did 35 years after he began it, uh, because this band kind of got in the way of things there for a while, um, Garrick was one of the advisors that he had and that's kind of how they oh. hit off and how Starmus got going. So Garrick sort of opened the festival here. You can see the theme of Starmus this time was 50 years on Mars because the Mars 3 probe, Soviet probe and Mariner 9 uh, both go back to, well, it wasn't exactly 50 years thanks to the pandemic, but it was planned to be 50 years later. We talked about a Martian theme here in large part. This is our uh, neighborhood uh, friendly billionaire who's on the board of Starmus with us, Tony Fidel. If any of you have an iPhone or an iPod, you can thank Tony because he's the inventor of the iPod and the co-inventor of the iPhone. Uh, and he also eventually then left Apple uh, and he began this company of home security stuff uh, that you may have heard of as well called Nest. So he's a really fun guy and a, just a riot to be around and kind of opened the festival as well with some, some very highly energized remarks. He's a great, funny guy. Yeah. And his son played in one of the bands. Oh, that's around right. Around in the city, I think, at the Central Star Party event there. I, I think you're right. Tony Fidel, uh, you know, of course, a lot of us were uh, getting pictures of each other. I was uh, getting photos with Christopher Goh and uh, Sebastian, who's, you know, one of the top AI scientists in the world. And um, uh, who else? Um, I'm forgetting right now. But Tony was in the back kind of photobombing us, you know. And so I said, OK, Tony, bring it on in, you know. And so we all took pictures <laughs> together. But uh you know, it just, you know, the, the, the moment of, of all this, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with these people, but there was no, there was no pretense. There was no, uh, you know, there was nothing uh, where you felt like 
someone was above you or whatever. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the, the, it was just, it was really, it was wonderful. That's all I can tell you. That's, I know that's cutting, cutting to the quick there and saying something that, that sounds, you know, but uh, it's, it goes beyond words. I mean, they really are the nicest, most genuine people. I think it's the people who are really trying to still get there who are not the nicest people. You know, the people who are really on this level are really wonderful. Yeah. Or kind of people. I yeah. would agree. Really nice. And and then this is still the opening concert. And then came along the greatest keyboard player in the history of rock and roll, Rick Wakeman, who is part of our group as, as well. And he he put on an incredible show to sort of open the whole thing with the symphony orchestra of, of the country and you might have heard he he had a band that he was in for a long time called yes um and he's just a remarkably talented uh, keyboardist and a, and a super nice guy and he's very very interested of course in science as well and this is a popular moment this was early in the proceedings here as well uh, you may have heard of this canadian astronaut chris hadfield and he did a famous version of David Bowie's song Space Oddity when he was on the International Space Station that got and it became incredibly viral and so on. And to hear Chris play that song live really gets to people as, as well. And so that was kind of a, a real highlight of the opening ceremony as well. There's a great bunch of people on our board with us. This is the woman who you may not realize it yet, but who may extend your life span, perhaps. This is Emmanuel Charpentier, who is a French Nobel Prize winning uh, biochemist. Uh, and she has developed this CRISPR technology of gene splicing that you may have heard about uh, that may uh, essentially uh, extend with therapy the lives of us in decades to come here. So. That is a big, big uh, step forward in biology. This is the fellow you were mentioning, uh, Bernard Skolkoff, who is is one of the who is he was hanging around the astro imaging. That's stuff. right, um, not Sebastian Bernard. That's I'm who he is. Talking about ordinary. Yeah. What kind of a lens do you use? You know, to shoot the North America nebula and stuff. <laughs> right. Find out, you know, a day later. This is one of the world's leading experts on artificial intelligence. Intelligence, yes. You know, who, you know, he's talking about, you know, lenses for a cannon to do shoot deep sky objects with. For, <laughs> it just shows how easy it is to do it. Even, yeah, yeah. You know, at 85, 1.4, 1.8, I'll bet you that's probably what he said <laughs> or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I had heard early on in the grasp of all. <laughs> I had heard early on that that he was uh, into artificial intelligence, and so, you know, I gave him. Uh, I had a short conversation with him and was talking about, um, you know, how far away we are from you know, super intelligent AI, and uh, he was he was saying, Scott, you have really nothing to worry about in your lifetime, so. <laughs> <laughs> that it's it's it, there's some huge problems to overcome uh yeah to try to get there we're, we're not quite uh where the the movies present we are with, no. with but but i mean it was astonishing because this you know he was sort of hanging around talking about chit chat and then you find out you know the next day he's a genius basically so this is kind of you know part and parcel of what the Starmus experience is like. And these people not having seen each other, you know, either in kind of carting you off to dinner and things like that. It's also an exercise in sleep deprivation. You know, I can tell you that Starmus, yeah. no doubt about that. But this guy, he's a very nice and, and very funny guy. Then we had our local comedian. This was a, a this, this fellow is a London-based uh, sleight of hand magician and illusionist, David Zambuca. He's a really funny, very nice guy as well. And he did a routine that uh, used all kinds of tricks. This is just kind of one moment here unmasking Einstein, but he had audience participation and it was very, very funny. And it was remarkable to narrow down to one person with the card that he was talking about 
Hmm. Entire arena of 5,000 people. And he, he narrowed it down to three and, you know, two and one. And the card that he had on stage, the, the partner card, this person wail out in the audience. You know, obviously it's a trick. We're scientists here, folks. But it was a <laughs> remarkable trick, wasn't it, Scott? It was. <laughs> it was, yeah. We're all wondering how in the heck did he do that? So. Also, a very friendly guy. I had a long conversation with him on the bus, uh, heading back over to the hotel and on to other things that were going on all night long uh, for Starmus. So I highly encourage you, uh, when the next Starmus happens, that you go. It, there's really nothing that's exactly quite like it. It's this kind of blend. It's quite remarkable. This is a, uh, a picture that I just call... You know, this this is, you know, warm up time, I'll call it, you know, this, this is Brian just sitting there, you know, we were in there for, you know, an hour just kind of fooling around while they were kind of getting the concert sound ready for the night that was to come there. And fortunately, we, we ran around and gave a lot of talks in other places. And Scott Hubbard here, who's at Stanford University now, he's an expert on Mars. Mm. But for years, he was the director of NASA's Ames Research Center in California. Um, so he is a guy who had many of the leading Mars scientists and others working for him, let alone being an expert on planetary science himself. And he was an incredibly nice guy. And again, just, you know, these people are just very warm and genuine, yeah. but basically geniuses, the knowledge bank that these guys have. Right. Another fellow who gave one of the early talks uh, is another Nobel Prize winner, Michelle Mayor. You may remember in 1995, the discovery of the first uh, exoplanet uh, orbiting a sun-like star. Uh, and this is the fellow who discovered that uh, planet um, and was awarded the Nobel Prize for this. And uh, so I don't take too long. I'll get through some of these speakers fairly quickly. This is uh, someone who had me rattled with an incredible scent, really dry and kind of assertive sense of humor. And we had a table at the opening dinner. Scott, I think you were nearby us. Yeah, I was. <laughs> and, uh, and we had a couple people with her and we had seats reserved and so on. And we were, had various people we were in with. And she was very, you know, upset that, well, what do you mean we can't sit here? And then played for a day. I thought this woman was really incensed with me because she couldn't sit at our table. It turns out she's the director of the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell University, Lisa Kaltenegger, who's an authority on a variety of things, um, but, but among them life in the universe and the search for extraterrestrial life. And she put on, you know, she she basically played a skit on me for a day and a half and then said, you know, I was just kidding you this whole time and came up and gave me a great big hug. And I thought, wow, <laughs> scientists, you got to watch your back. You got to watch them. <laughs> That's right. That was quite something. There's another great planetary scientist who's a good pal for many years of us, Dave Grinspoon. He's the fellow who co-wrote the book on New Horizons with Alan Stern, another good pal of ours. And mm -hmm. Dave Grinspoon not only grew up as a child with his father, who was a famous researcher, being one of Carl Sagan's best pals in New York, uh, but David, among other things, is one of the world's leading uh, authorities on Venus, among other planets. So he gave a talk on climate change okay. on Venus Mars, and believe it or not, yes, it's happening on Earth, too. So he's a really great guy and a funny guy and full of all sorts of good stories. Well, this was actually not the warm up, not the sound check, but the actual performance here with Brian. You can see, you know, he almost has a sort of a Sergeant Peppery uh, outfit on here, which he used in, in Queen's tour this year. And he has a longstanding friend, Graham Gouldman here, who he wrote a song called Floating in Heaven, which they released this year, actually, you may know this. And Graham had a band back in the day that went on for a long, long while called 10CC. And they had some hits as well. And so they collaborated on this and, and kind of opened this big uh, main concert night, if you will, Graham and Brian together. 
Well, of course, what happened after the concert other than, you know, I got a message along with another friend who was sitting next to me, come back to Brian's dressing room right away after the show. So we went back there and we were escort. We actually had a police escort and two cars that took us screaming out of this after the concert. So we went to a restaurant that was closed that you can see here just for us, which was really nice. And we had a dinner that lasted until about 3.30 a.m. Um, you know, again, it's a marathon, you know, crazy catching up. And it was great because Charlie Duke, our pal, our moonwalker pal here, uh, and Dottie Duke, uh, here you can see his wife were with us. And, and so it's always electrifying to hear Charlie or another moonwalker talk uh, about, I don't care if you've heard the stories before, talking about walking on the moon and what the experience was like there and Apollo 16 and what they did and just absolutely, you know, makes your hair stand on end. And so we had a very, very wonderful time uh, catching up after the show, even though we got, I think it was about two hours of sleep that night and we were up and at it again. So start, you know, you need to sleep a lot before and after Starmus potentially. Then the next day we had the world's leading authority uh, on black holes, our, our dearly beloved friend Stephen Hawking, of course, is no longer with us, but Kip Thorne of Caltech is, and so he's the, the man when it comes to black hole theory. And he wrote a very cool book with a, an artist friend called Leah Halloran, who's here with him, and they did a sort of a multimedia show about black holes and about gravity and about time warps. Uh, and you can see this book online if you go to Amazon, uh, and they talked all about what black holes really are. And of course, there are a lot of misconceptions, some of which were fueled by black hole scientists about black holes. And so to hear Kip sort of set the record straight, um, you know, I don't care if you heard this talk before, it's, it's really magical to hear the guy who is the world's leading expert on one of the coolest things in the universe. This fellow, Mark Boslow, is another old friend, and he's been a Starmus regular for us, and he's the world's leading expert, if you will, on impacts and explosions, uh, and is at Sandia National Labs in New Mexico, uh, near Albuquerque, and mm -hmm. uh, is, among other things, the, the preeminent expert, if you will, on energies and what happens with impacts and that goes uh, from things like Chelyabinsk, you know, which was pretty minor, but in our time, all the way back to the KPG impact and others that, you know, did the dinosaurs no favors. So it's always, he's a great speaker as well and, and really uh, interesting and talented to listen to because of all of the uh, wide range of expertise. And then Scott, I don't know if you'd like to jump in. This is Garney yeah. Temple, where we had the star party. And this was really your baby, Scott. Yeah, um, this will, uh, I was amazing in the respect that I, you know, of course, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, this is a first century AD pagan temple, you know, so it's pre-Christian. Uh, you know, um, it has, uh, I didn't learn all about the architecture, but it uh, definitely is Roman uh, architecture. Uh, there are, uh, you know, it, it has been destroyed, I think, a couple of times and rebuilt, uh, you know, so you can see kind of newer parts of it and older parts kind of in this jigsaw uh, construction that you see here with the light and dark uh, stones. Uh, inside of it was actually quite small and there was just like this small table for making um, you know uh, reading something or doing you know some sort of ceremony on the inside uh, walking around it uh, you know it did feel there was a sacred kind of feeling about it and stuff so we did we went uh, early you know a couple of days early to check it out and to see uh, where we would put our telescopes and, uh, you know, the best part of the sky to look at and everything. When we got there for the event, uh, it had uh, the, an incredible lighting job. I, I know that the International Dark Sky Association might not have approved this particular uh, star party event, but uh, the stage uh, with uh, the, one of the bands called No Sound, its its band leader is an incredible astrophotographer. By the way, I was looking at uh, you know long exposure, you know sixty hour long exposures that he had done 
uh, and he was into it. Um, their music was incredible. Uh, uh, we had astronauts there. We had uh, laure Nobel laureates there. Uh, people that had bought uh, tickets uh, to come to this particular event uh, were treated to really, um, you know, a five-star, maybe six-star type of event. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, the company, I think it's pronounced Ararat. Is that right, mm -hmm. Dave? Yeah, they, they make the um, brandy that I think that uh, Winston Churchill preferred, uh, you know, so they, that, that distillery has been around for a long time. They were this, they're serving free brandy uh, at the event. There was also a micro beer brewery uh, that was there uh, also serving. Uh, we were treated to a very traditional Armenian dinner and you're sitting down with the likes of, uh, you know, uh, astronauts, you know, Charlie Duke, of course, was there and just just everyone. And it was just amazing uh, to be there with this. And then the amateur astronomy uh, group in Yerevan was there manning telescopes. Uh, uh, you know, maybe manning's the wrong word because there are plenty of women there running telescopes, too. Um, and uh, uh, even though with all the lights on and everything, we were still able to see plenty of deep sky objects. Uh, the air is very transparent in, at that uh, location in, in Yerevan. And, um, but uh, I did learn, David, uh, maybe you can set the record straight here, but uh, uh, I heard that, uh, the, that UNESCO has never allowed a World Heritage Site to be used as a center for an event any that even remotely um, uh, resembled this, you know, with live music and and refreshments and stuff like that. So it was uh, um, it was quite a privilege to be able to do this here. And just, you know, so I went back. I, I of course, have pictures of this as well. I went back to the as far back as I could get with my iPhone and my cameras and stuff like that and just took photos. I was just trying to take it all in, you know, because it really was an amazing social star party, you know, and with people just having a great time. Uh, part of the volunteers of our group, of course, they were all there um, uh, helping people get the scope set up and collimated and everything. Um, uh, one of those people was uh, Norman Fulham, who makes uh, those giant Newtonian telescopes. He was there. He's also a musician, and he's also performed on Global Star Party before. Uh, you know, he, uh, he performed Rocket Man live on that stage uh, for the audience, and they really got into it. So it was really cool. It, it was something we've really never had an event, a star party event quite like that. And a lot of people who were there had their first view through a telescope that night and were really emotional about it. Yes. Yep. So it was just a, a great event. Oh, this this I'm glad you got this picture. This is uh, this yeah. is a special moment. So, so this is a, there's a fellow there, there, there's a fellow who's a fam really famous guitar player. I'm not talking about Brian, who's right in the picture here, but but. Uh, Slash, you may have heard of, who's the guitarist for Guns N' Roses, you know, very famous band. This is Bumblefoot Tall on the right here. The other guitarist who was in Guns N' Roses with Slash, not Slash, uh, but he also has his own super group, if you will, called Sons of Apollo. And they were there and boy, they really that was some pretty edgy rock we had from them for a while on that night. And of course, Bumblefoot, what does he do, but to come over and play right in Brian's face, you know? And yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, a face melting uh, guitar lead. It was just, uh, yeah, and, and the closer he got to Brian May, the more amazing this guy became, you know, it was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, so and it, was, is it was incredible. Right, right. Garrick is on the left edge there as well. And and so, yeah, that, that was quite a moment uh, of fun. And, and Brian was very gracious, of course, about it as well. We also uh, gave a number of Stephen Hawking awards for science communication, which the board awards. And the probably the preeminent one, if you will, this year was to Jane Goodall who is really the great uh, leader and expert and w the wisest founder, if you will, 
um, of the science of, of studying chimpanzees, you know, and, and there's such a heritage that she has of understanding chimpanzee behavior. She was not able to come physically to uh, Yerevan, but she was with us, joined us via link. And boy, the, I don't know, Scott, if you remember the, mm -hmm. the talk that she gave about humanity and where we're going and the meaning of life. Oh, yeah. Together yes. Together. You know, it, 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 she really, I mean, she shared with us, uh, you know, some profound wisdom about what, you know, being a part of humanity is all about, you know. Yeah. And, and there were people who teared up from that talk. Even yeah. as well. It was quite something. Yeah. Um, and then we go we go from profound uh, philosophy to our pal Michael Bakich who um, uh, uh, hosted some of the days on stage and was very enthusiastic. And, you know, if you know Michael, Michael has kind of a little bit of a Rodney Dangerfield kind of a feel, if you will, of, you know, of throwing some jokes out there and making sure <laughs> the audience is very relaxed. And so that went over very well. And I can tell you that Garrick has already asked me to get Michael to host some of the days in the future. So oh, Mike's crazy. crazy jokes and stuff worked very well uh, uh so that that was a good thing for for him he really enjoyed that one of the days we also had the chance to go and visit Erebuni uh fortress which is up on the highest point of Yerevan here which is a fortress that was established in 782 BC uh and has been rebuilt and was assaulted multiple times and captured and recaptured and just incredible to see the the history that goes back uh, so far um, in this site. And, and this is kind of a shot of all of the Starmus speakers gathering uh, for a for a shot. It was comical because we all marched to the back of the stage and stood there and Brian and everyone else looked down at the stage wondering what the hell we were doing. And then they told <laughs> us we were in the wrong place and we had to march out to the front again. So it was a little bit comical, but we eventually got to the right place and took a group photo there. Um, and forgive me, uh, for, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, I took that one out. Okay, it wasn't that, or maybe I didn't, I don't remember now. Anyway, we opened, this is actually going back to the start of the festival, and we, festival, and we opened with a press conference uh, with some of our board members and Nobel Prize winners here, and with the astronaut on, on the left there, Garrett Reisman, who is a, a, a space shuttle and an ISS astronaut, and that's Emmanuel uh, with me. Um, there in the middle and Michelle Mayor, and, and then a very talented um, scientist who's a multidisciplinary scientist, Chris Rapley, who among many other things has been the director of the Science Museum in London, who's a really nice guy and mm -hmm. a super special guy. And forgive me, um, I thought I would end with a little bit of a self-serving one because Scott was in on this conspiracy, but several of Scott and Sammy, who was shepherding me around, and several others, Michael and Holly, conspired to surprise me because while I was there on this day in, in uh, um, Yerevan during Starmus, I uh, recorded my 40-year anniversary at Astronomy Magazine. All right. So they gave it me- was fun of gin with astronomer this this fellow who makes this gin it makes it it's astronomer's gin you know so scott and i had to you know do a toast and i think we had three or four shots of this each something like that scott and we had a little cake and celebrated and thank yep. you for that and and uh, that was really meaningful to me a lot of fun yeah it was meaningful to me too i mean to think you've spent four decades uh, at astronomy, um, you know, does it feel like 40 years? You know, yes and no. I mean, it's in one sense, it seems like a long, long time ago. And we've had a it's since the old days with Richard Berry and Robert Burnham there. It's that's a long time. It's many, many changes have happened since then. And in another sense, it's all, you know, like it's happened in a flash. And it's been a great, great deal of fun. And, and I look forward at some point here to uh, pulling up stakes and just having a lot of a lot of fun, you know, with astronomy again someday here. <laughs> yes, wonderful. So it's been quite an experience, and I will end uh, screen sharing. Scott, we were so um, proud to have you there, and I know we have plans to 
uh, move forward, which I think at some point reasonably soon, we'll have some things to talk about, about a future Starmus. Can't say anything right now, but but I think it'll be a great fun. And I would encourage everyone who can come to yeah. do so because you can see how, what a special experience it is. Yeah, it's, it's more than just hanging out with geniuses and it's more than the music. It's more than all of this stuff. It's a it's an important, profound uh, experience that when you're there, you're part of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's not like you're sidelined in any way. And, um, you know, the uh, uh, this event had a lot of volunteers. We talked, you talked, uh, you know, I touched on it briefly. You talked more about it, but the volunteers uh, really, I mean, pulled the whole event together for us. They made sure that people were taken care of, that they were uh, protected, that they were on time, uh, all this stuff. And, and um, you know, uh, I just trying to watch all the moving pieces of Starmus. It was complex, yet it had its, its, um, it had its glue. And I think that a big part of that glue was the volunteers that, uh, that were there. Uh, I imagine that uh, in future Starmuses, if you are so compelled um, that you could volunteer for something like that, if you could give up about three to four weeks of your life and, uh, <laughs> and many sleepless nights, because <laughs> they were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you could have called any one of them and they would have been there with whatever you needed. So that was uh, really amazing. You had a personal assistant for a week, basically. It was really yeah. And, and I show I, one more thing to underscore, you know, uh, I showed a, a selection of some speakers with the main stage, with the events in town, in the city, with uh, going to schools here and there. There were well more than 40 speakers. Yeah. Um, you know, th th this is a tiny slice of what actually happened there. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so Nagin uh, Cox was there from JPL. You know, she's managing uh, the rovers on Mars, uh, um, you know, and to sit down afterward, after the event and have have a, a drink and have something to eat. And all those people are just around you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that was <laughs> it made it seem a little surreal in that respect. Um, uh, but um, uh, all, every one of them said, you know, I don't know how it all came together. It did. Uh, and, um, you know, they can't wait to do it again. So, well, I can tell you that we will do it again. And uh, at some point and perhaps reasonably soon, we'll be able to talk about that. Great. Great. Thank you, David. That was awesome. That was Thanks. awesome. All right. OK, so um, we're moving on uh, at this point and uh, by the way, I've shared some um, uh, YouTube videos of, uh, you know, Graham Gould and um, Brian May uh, performing, performing Floating in, in Heaven. You can watch it on YouTube when you get a chance here. And a section with Bumblefoot, who is really uh, one of the most gifted uh, uh, rock guitarists uh, that, that's out there. And that dude was cool. I mean, he... We're hanging out in the lobby of the hotel, and he's letting us hold his double neck guitar, which I don't know how much that thing costs, but uh, that was just uh, absolutely awesome. Um, but um, uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, Adrian Bradley, who's been waiting patiently uh, backstage here, and so we're going to bring you on. Thanks, Adrian, for coming back on to Global Star Party again. Absolutely. And um, the topic that you picked um, couldn't have been more to what makes me go outside, even when it's lightning out back. I don't know, Terry, if you're still listening, I don't know if you've ever been out when there's been a distant thunderhead that you didn't expect to be there, but you even try and take pictures of that as well when you're um when you're out imaging the night sky um so so i think what i'll do um scott is i'm just going to go right into sharing my screen and use some of the images i've collected over the last um month or so while um you and uh david Iker were in starmus and i 
I'm kind of thinking, you know, I was an Okie Tex and maybe I went to the wrong forum. Maybe I should have <laughs> saved the pennies and went to flew to Starmus instead uh, because yeah. that just looked the sky looked images you could have done from um, from uh, uh, the Temple of Garni would have been that would have been a great amazing. foreground. Oh yeah, yeah. I wish I had your uh, talent and equipment, uh, you know, just to. Uh, uh, get some of the to, just to try to take it in it was really amazing um, well and we're going to start right away with an image that I think typifies what your topic was there I am in a self-portrait basically um, looking at the night sky just sitting there and uh, contemplating what I'm seeing and if if you know your constellations, you know you're looking at Orion, Taurus, and this part of the Winter Milky Way over Lake Huron, it's a, uh, a Bortle 3 to Bortle 4 sky. You've got the fall. This is, a, this is a slice in time. Anytime I'm out imaging the night sky, this is what it looks like before I actually hit the button. So sometimes... I'll go ahead and I'll hit the button while sitting there and see if I can sit still for two minutes. So that's something I've started. So the question is, how did I get here? Well, that same night, I fired at the Cygnus region and I noticed I got some fall colors here as well. It's fall in Michigan. I'm back from Okitex. And so we're going through this story backwards where I'm noticing the Milky Way dust lanes don't come out, even with two minute exposures, one for the ground and one for the sky. This is all I can get. It's a beautiful location and you can see the fall leaves. And I was able to capture this the way the eye sees it, you know, if if there were a little more light, of course, but um, it's a very natural setting. And if you walk down here, and you look over this lake, this, this might be what you see with some trees in the distance. Some have lost their leaves. There's some fall colors here and there's leaves this way. So, you know, also this is a, this is a simple shot, but it's our winter hexagon or winter circle with Sirius here, Rigel here, Al Debrin here, um, looking for, which I do believe this is Capella of Auriga and Castor Pollux. Um, and help me name this star. It's, it's escaped me. It's, uh, the look, it's Canis Minor, um, that fills out the circle. This has joined Procyon. the winter circle. Procyon. Say it again. Procyon. Yeah. Mars is now a part of the winter circle for this season. Fits right in line. Well, maybe it. you kind of have a dip to Mars and then back to Capella. And um, Procyon right here. And Sirius. So our winter circle has a visitor this year and um i thought that was interesting so i frame it against this tree and and i took this image so having come back to michigan where if you shoot in the daytime you get fall colors like this um it that's what led to trying to do those fall colors at night but I came when I came back, I thought I'd try my hand at Milky Way photography at another favorite spot. I wasn't getting much of the Milky Way as uh, Perseus is here, the double cluster, but I noticed there's a thunderhead in the distance. So, you know, the picture that's in my background, this is a full image. So I turned my attention to trying to capture light. If I could capture a bolt from the thunderhead, this is probably the best shot. Um, I think you can see some of the rain and the it's a distance sea storm. And whenever there's one of these, you know, the stars are above it, but it often captures my attention. 
when I tried to shoot at the core of the Milky Way, I didn't have my tracking unit. So I got a lot of stars, streaks, and barely this part of the Milky Way. And when I wanted the Thunderhead to produce more lightning, it wouldn't work. <laughs> so, so I just accepted what I got here. In order to get here, this is where Terry Mann was talking about. You see these woods behind me. It's about a quarter mile walk through a trail in these woods to get to this spot um, in order to take photos. So you do have to be committed. If you're there with a friend, it's great. If you're um, there by yourself, you just have to trust that the animals really don't want to come after you. They, unless they're hungry, and then you might have to make a noise and, um, you know, and they go away quietly. Now, as we're traveling back, we, um, we got a chance. Let's see. We'll go with. We'll go with this picture taken one of the last nights at Okie Tex over one of the mesas, the uh, earth shine here and the bright moon. Yeah. Look at the way it's lighting up the, the top of the tree. Yeah. I mean, you can tell this is not a, um, you know, this isn't something done in Photoshop. <laughs> this is right. Real. That was the, that was the single real image. And I just cropped it in and tried to um, expand it a bit. Yeah, the Photoshop, if I wanted to be a Photoshop hero, we'd take another image, layer it on top, and maybe even try and do some stars. But I like simplicity in my photos. Um, you know, putting a lot of effort into photos, you do that sometimes when you want the picture to be a reflection of your own how great you are at doing pictures but if you want the honorable D david to like your photo you best keep it simple and you best keep it about the night sky itself <laughs> or you may you may get a harsh rejection oh, say, this isn't <laughs> when david sent an email yeah, you're getting uh, you're getting accolades here from the audience so that's great yeah um you know, we've got these mineral moons, David, that you've probably been sent and um, you know the moon well and um, you can tell when it's something that has lost its natural appeal. You too, Scott, everyone out there. Yeah, those those can be very interesting. And I'll give you a case in point um, with some of the images I tried to collect of the Zodiacal Light and Orion. We, we tried it again for this year. We captured it. And sometimes the sharpness, you know, the, the resulting image may not have quite been, you know, the way that I would have liked it. I actually want to leave that there. Um, here's an example. So this, I think, is a little overdone. It's, it's, you've got a lot of dust lanes. And the thing about dark sites the dust lanes in the Milky Way are much more visible and you know, it's much easier to pick them up in images. And all these stars come along for the ride because there's so many, so much more starlight can come in. And while you've got detail, you know, if you like it for the detail, like I can go zoom in and there's the shape of M23 right there. Um, but you sometimes blow out some of the features here and it's possible to take shots. You know, there's around here, I think Bades or Bodies window appears. It's possible to get that sort of imagery, but you just have to be careful with um, the settings that you use. Whereas a shot like this, well, the foreground looks a little more natural here, even if it's a composite. And yes, lots of red light. This was a, a night that got cloudy. So a lot of people took more liberty at brightening their uh, lights. But look at the dust lane here. Um, very much visible. The stars here, it doesn't appear to be a split in the Milky Way. It appears to be a full unit, essentially. 
and there's Altair, Tarzed. And if you've seen some of my other presentations, you know that I like to look for Barnard Z and see how it looks. And I like to look for the coat hanger and see how it looks and whether I've got some colorful stars whenever I do this section of the Milky Way. Many might say, well, Milky Way season is over when this part of it sets, to which I say Milky Way season is all year round. Cygnus sets over here and it's in a dark area where you've got all the sky glow, it still can be as bright as the core. Um, let's see, here's uh, another attempt and there's a meteor that's streaked through this image. M45 sits in the zodiacal light here. Wow. There's M45. Yeah. There's the zodiacal light. And Leo is raising its head. I think it's hard to see where Regulus and where the other stars of Leo's head. But It's amazing to see the landscape before us, too, lit up by yes. starlight. This is not... Absolutely. Not like yeah, you know, this is Milky Way light lighting up the hills out there, uh, you know. Yes. Uh, when you process. Black you, Mesa, Oklahoma. Yep. When you process, you can really see how the lighting, the shading changes based on this light from Zodiacal light. Gegenschein, maybe an hour or two prior to the Zodiacal light forming. I know there are times when both will be visible depending on when it comes up and i have yet to capture that but uh milky way can, light yeah milky way really. light is amazing you can you can see a faint shadow around yes, each one of the cactus and stuff like that but it's not it's not elongated or sharp um you know like you would from uh the sun yes. so it's uh you know it's very it's like uh, an amazing studio lighting <laughs> you know yes it, it absolutely is and yeah. it does help you when you shoot a photo like this now chromatic aberration i don't recall if i used the tracker i was able to get this mm -hmm. you know to show exactly how camp looks this is sort of a with your eyes what you see and you see most of this some of the detail you know is not as it may be a little clearer with the picture but this is an eye view you can see you know the butterfly rising over the mesa over here so it's it's an amazing time and i always recommend um that you know, if anyone comes out, come on out and, you know, take a look at the night sky. Here you've got, we back off a little bit and we've got, you know, we've got the Mesa. This is, this is essentially what you're looking at when you go to Okitex. There are a bunch of campers, telescopes out. Here's somebody who's sitting there working on his imaging. You got the big dobs, you got this scope here um from next door and you've got the milky way just sitting here with the cat's paw and these four stars which are part of the uh lobster claw and you've got all of these all of this detail the ptolemy's cluster here the butterfly somewhere here over sagittarius m22 there's m22 shining the lagoon right. drifted. All of these M23, M25, small Sagittarius star cloud. And I spent a lot of time observing even more so than imaging, just because I wanted to I wanted to capture with my own eyes what I'm seeing in another view of the uh, Cygnus region. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And, Look at that. So yeah, the whole summer triangle over this mesa. Yes, very serene and and there there's a lot. Even and this the shot here typifies what a cloudy night looks like that you generally don't see when you're looking at the night sky. It's all clouded up except for a 
bright region poking through the galactic center. In only 30 seconds, we have all of this star detail here. And um, there's, there's M23 sneaking through. Everything else is covered by this, these dark clouds, which because there's no light pollution, they're dark underside. So it's just like someone's closing the uh, observatory door on top and um and you can still get a beautiful shot if you know if any part of the milky way presents itself yeah, it's cool and one thing that i always try to mention you know when you give me the opportunity is milky way season never ends um there are going to be some images that i'm showing again but um and here i was able to finally get a clear view and some more HA detail here. You've got this section of the Milky Way near Orion. That's a challenge for those who are only used to shooting the core. Sure, shooting the core can be beautiful. You've got all this. I decided to shoot it here. And this image kind of typifies what the Knights at Okie Techs look like. Um, if we go all the way back to, um, I'm not even sure I can do that, but I'll try. Um, let's see if this is the one. So from my location at home, you know, you've got this, but from Okitex, you've got this same region. Look how much more detail you can get. Um, the Cygnus region looks like this. That's amazing. And and in a portal through sky, it's not that far off, but you see how it's a little more faint in a portal three, portal four sky at two minutes versus the two minute shot that I took here fills in a little bit more and there's a little more detail going towards the uh, where the bulge starts which is below horizon what happens with our type of photography is the cooler looking the landscape the more people are drawn into the photo but if you don't live in an area where you've got great rock formations try and make your sky something that you can look at yeah. there's the pelican there's the north american can we see that in michigan well now well, that we it is yeah if you can see it you can still see it so yeah. and that's when you know when jason um comes on jason Gwenzel, um with you know with direct shots like maybe here's my one wide field shot classic astrophotography here the california this rift is from the milky way and the pleiades on this side um i was able to get somewhere i think two minute shots look at the density of stars those that process there's a reason that they take some of the worlds out any one of these worlds could have a planet around it that might be similar to earth so you know you don't want to just you want to take it lightly when you're removing stars you could be removing yeah like planets <laughs> whole but, civilizations uh, right you're moving whole civilizations for the sake of a beautiful image <laughs> but i do understand when when it's so chock full of stars like this and you want to highlight you know i've seen a lot more a lot more time given to the pleiades this void really exists that's near there you can kind of see it and you've got the dust lanes here the detail you can get, this was with, I believe, um, and I'm trying to think of the camera. I think I use an 85 millimeter lens on this, mm -hmm. um, either 85 or a 35 millimeter lens, one of the two, and then did a crop and gathered about an hour's worth of data to get this. Tracking with one of your Scott, one of your explorer scientific oh. IXOS unguided. Wow, that's nice. That's nice. So, uh, so 
shameless plug for Scott's equipment. <laughs> I actually used it to take the shot of myself. That's cool. Thank you. You know, all the way back. Uh, we'll have to uh, myself. Yeah, I love done. that shot too. It just looks. Um, uh, that should be like uh, you know the last picture uh, or the first picture of of your next book. So I really, I've really had that cool. suggestion and I'm I'm thinking I'm going to follow up with that. Yeah. So so what I'll do is I'll um I tried to capture what it really looks like when it's dark time and you're at a board of one sky and you're at this and this was the best I could come up with the Milky Way appears roughly like this you know your eyes have more dynamic range than i captured in this composite but and this actually may be a single picture now that i think of it but this is roughly how the milky way looks how mm -hmm. bright it looks and um now do i know whether or not you can actually see m22 naked eye i'm not so sure you know, some with a camera, you pull out a little more detail than you can see. You can absolutely see M6 and M7 naked eye. You can see M8 naked eye. You see the Sagittarius star cloud. I don't think you quite make out. These become, gl they glow, but you don't quite make it out. You can absolutely see these dust lanes. And you see this yeah. dust lane here. I don't think you quite see these four stars, these little dim stars, but they, of course, come out in a photo. Um, when you image, of course, all of that detail, including the tails, everyone likes to image Rofuyuki. Um, I'll go ahead and drop Molly Wakeling's name. She was here and she got some very beautiful images uh, while out at Oki Tex. So it was, uh, it was nice to see what's going on so i'm going to i'm going to do a comparison one quick comparison photo this was last year where i edited the data and this year that was my updated image not much different really let's go back one more one more time so we can yeah see let's see if i did this right um let's see if this is the nope so we'll go back uh so so this was a processed image i did in 2021 mm -hmm. and then i think if all i gotta do is just close this and that and this is the processed image mm -hmm. from 2022 a little bit of vignetting here you know that it's okay doesn't look much right. different but it does <clears throat> that's basically how it looked at twilight yeah and this milky way comes out at twilight these dust lanes are visible naked eye and you use them to jump across here this dust lane this ldn i want to say it's ldn 90 that little dust lane is visible and then this dot right here is actually the wild duck M11. Those are, you, you learn where the Messier objects and the NGC objects, I've got a few more to learn, um, but when you can see those objects in a Milky Way photo, you know that you've got a decent, and I do mean decent uh, detailed image. And again, it's, for me, it's about marrying the earth with yeah. the Milky Way. So we showed this image. Well, when you turned around, you saw the other side. And I see. this part of the Milky Way with M33 here. M and then M31. M31. Yeah. I wonder you can if see the dust lane. You can actually see the dust lane yeah. there. There it is. Yep. And I wonder if M110 somewhere, if there's a glow, it may have disappeared in the... Uh, noise reduction the noise reduction sometimes is or is not your friend you know if you blow things out the double cluster gets bright but the heart and soul show up and then there's all of these other nebula that you know i need to that i definitely need to take the time to look at and you may ask well why is are these mountaintops red well that's light that was captured by my modded camera that's shining from camp all the yeah, red all the light red. 
that's is actually amazing. on those mesas, <laughs> reflecting that's, on those that's mesas. Amazing. That's amazing. And I left it there. I just said, thank well, you. that that red light's actually there. So yeah. And, well, thank uh, you, Adrian, for sharing. Oh, all you're this. absolutely thank welcome. You. Yeah, and, we, uh, did, we have to be moving on to our next speaker, but right. uh, and, uh, and those were amazing, and and uh, we'll we'll have to see more next week. So yeah, ready, I'll have on. to I'll have to go get some more. Um, in good, well, fall colors, and I think yeah, I blew away. I think uh, Jason, it's your turn. It is his but, turn. Uh, yep. Where is the? I wanted to do. The final, here we go, real quick. I'm ending on that final image. Go out and look at the night sky, contemplate, and just enjoy it. Even if you don't do imaging, yeah. see it for yourself and see That's what right. happens to your mind. See if you aren't somehow rejuvenated. And yeah. this empty chair for those who should be joining you and sitting in that chair with you, invite someone along. Yeah. So there you go. Let me thank uh, you, Adrian. Thank you over. so much. Sorry. That's You're awesome. welcome. All right. So coming up next here is um, uh, uh, Jason Gonzalez, the vast reaches. Um, uh, Jason, thank you for coming on uh, with us. We've, uh, you know, it seems God was only gone for um, a couple of months, um, you know, running around doing all kinds of uh, in-person types of, of events, but um, I have to admit, I really missed uh, the Tuesday night Global Star Party and uh, uh, to be able to sit down in comfort with everybody and, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've all learned, uh, even though uh, the pandemic is, I guess, officially over, you know, we are all traveling around and you go to places and no one's wearing masks anymore. And it's, it kind of seems like a, a weird dream that, that happened. But uh, of course, COVID is still with us. And uh, there are still people in the world who can't uh, leave for various reasons. Um, and uh, Global Star Party uh, does serve that audience. Um, you know, uh, it gives you an opportunity to uh, send chats, you know, live chats to us and to uh, see um, presentations from some of the top uh, astronomers in the world. So, yep. And so, Jason, are you uh, are you ready to come on at this point, or your audio is? Yeah, let's get your audio. No audio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Still no audio. <laughs> so I have an idea, Jason. Um, uh, you, you could might have to do a silent. Uh, no, 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 no. He doesn't have to do that. He can actually. He can actually call me, uh, and I can. I can uh, have his voice over telephone onto my microphone. I've oh, done that, that kind of thing before. I think he's actually going for, I think it's plan B is a laptop though. I just saw laptop. Oh, that. okay. He could do that too. That's the cool thing about uh, the platform that we're on. Um, uh, when I was at the Arizona dark sky star party, we had one guy running PowerPoints, another guy, uh, you know, running a, uh, you know, various zoom, you got multiple zoom connections and mm -hmm. mix uh, your presentation which is kind of cool so yeah i've had, I had to do that a couple times i think because uh mm -hmm. if i came in like say i'm on the road as i usually am from imaging or something and right. then i get to the computer or something doesn't work out i've done that where i'll present with the computer and talk mm -hmm. on the phone so yeah i've, I've been there before yeah make doing all of the stuff that we're doing here to give a presentation um can be a little um can be a little tough so i think that uh i think jason yep. has now logged in with another computer to get us audio here you want to say something can you hear me 
I can hear you fine. I can hear you. All right, hold on yeah. for a second. I got I got to turn the speaker off on this thing. Okay. So I don't feed back. Yeah. Get... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, so now, how do I hear? Can you still hear me? Oh, I can, can still hear you. Me. Yeah. All right. I got an echo on my end. Um, uh, let me try to turn. Turn the volume down off. on one of them. Yeah, and turn it all the way down on one. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's a little disconnect between the video and the audio, but that's okay. Yeah, it's that's okay. happening. Right. Yeah, I got one crazy setup going on here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, all, all right. right. Well, as long yours. as I'm coming through full volume, because you guys are really uh, quiet to me, I, I can just uh, talk. I have. Um, so just one final check. This is working. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. I apologize. Um, so I've got. Um, thanks for having me on, Scott. And again, sorry for all the uh, discombobulation. But yeah, it's all right. I got a little bit of. of uh, um, presentation I put together. I did a talk at a local astronomy club here last week, and I'll just uh, walk through that because, you know, the topic of this is, um, you know, how we connect with the night sky. And um, really, that's what astrophotography is all about for me, is that connection we have with the night sky and, and my ability to, um, to kind of explore from my backyard. Let me see if I can get my screen shared here. And let me know when you're able to see this. Yeah, it's good. Good. Yep. All right. Well, okay. One way or another, we did this. I don't know how. I tried to hook my laptop up and that didn't work either. But this we is, have the uh, technology. So, um, you know, like we, you know, like the others before me, um, you know, astronomy um, to me is about, you know, exploration. It's also about, you know, introspection and connecting to the cosmos. And, um, you know, I, I started pretty young with the interest and I just kind of developed that over time. Um, you know, my parents kind of sponsored me. Um, this goes a little bit back into my uh, my journey into, into photography. And uh, as a kid, I took a few trips to Kennedy Space Center, uh, saw space shuttle launches. This was, you know, in the 80s. Um, at about the age of 10, my parents gifted me this telescope that you see here in the center. And I actually still own this thing. It's a, a cheap department store refractor, um, Jason brand. And I thought it was cool because it had my name on the side. But this past summer, I... I um, put my iPhone behind it and I still am able to get decent images through this. And it just kind of demonstrates that maybe you don't need so much to kind of get that connection. Um, you know, all told the equipment here is uh, dirt cheap. If you were to find one on a uh, Facebook marketplace or something, you could probably pick it up for free. But uh, I thought, you know, still relatively decent crisp shots of the moon through that little telescope. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, out of, out of childhood, I, you know, were, had my young adult life where, you know, I wasn't really involved in astronomy at all. And in uh, 2009, I picked up a Canon Rebel camera because I've always had this interest in landscape photography. And really that kind of spawned a, a reconnection with the night sky. I immediately took that camera and started shooting. I bought it because I was going on a vacation up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And um, during that trip, I took what I consider my first few um, astrophotography shots. And that's uh, the ones you see on the screen here. The, um, the planet Venus below the crescent moon rising in the dawn. And even at this point, I had the wherewithal to, to realize that I was um, you know, underexposing the moon because I could see the earth shine with my eyes. So I was playing around with exposure and I, I hardly had a, an astrophotography setup at all. I had the uh, camera balancing on a lawn chair and I was taking pictures of the night sky, but uh, that was kind of really the beginning for me. And then I kind of progressed through the hobby. I, um, I took that same camera and on a fixed tripod and I pointed it up and I was trying to shoot a picture of 
Andromeda. And the picture you see at the top is that is the result of that. It looks pretty bad at this point um, in retrospect, but I was super excited by that shot because I could uh, line it up to a photograph I consider good and I could see, okay, I'm, you know, I'm picking up M110. I'm, I'm actually seeing a little bit of dust lane in the, in the galaxy. And it wasn't just, but a few years later, I took that shot at the bottom using the same camera. Uh, so again, it shows you that it's not necessarily about equipment. It's about the, the dedication to the craft and, and kind of figuring out where you need to improve. And then going a little bit further down that road, uh, getting a, a better telescope for, for shooting um, longer focal lengths. And this is uh, the same shot of similar, you know, framing of an Andromeda just zoomed in a little bit. And uh, with this telescope, I'm picking up individual blue supergiant stars in NGC and two, NGC 206 here in the center. And stepping forward, you know, I'm still kind of playing with astrophotography and, and um, you know, seeing what I can do with different representations of the data. So I've, I've kind of dug into given some of these photos of, of video treatment, a 3D effect um, by animating depth into these, these shots, kind of brings them alive. So it's something I enjoy doing, um, moves a little bit deeper into the artistic side of astrophotography. You know, uh, maybe some of this isn't scientifically correct, but again, the visual interest inspires me and also, you know, people with a passing interest in astronomy or space, you know, look at this and um, it's kind of eye candy. So it, it definitely drums up some interests and questions and kind of goes from there. So about me, that, that childhood interest in astronomy led to an engineering career. Um, I got an aerospace engineering degree and worked in various um, industries, um, always in product design and development. But um, you know, I really enjoy sharing astrophotography and I've taken to social media as a form of public outreach, basically. So I've been fortunate to grow a large community online and, and, um, and I share these things and I try to, to use them as sort of an impetus to some form of education about the, uh, what we're seeing in the night sky. And I try to inspire people to get started in this. And uh, that sort of approach led to many opportunities um, and recognitions. We got, uh, you know, astronomy picture of the day a few times, other uh, photographic awards and, and some publications, um, you know, all, all through uh, just progressing through the hobby. Um, you know, letting my interest kind of shine through. So stepping back uh, and just looking at astrophotography at a glance. Um, I really kind of separate it into two main pillars and that's the science side, which can still be amateur science or what I call citizen science. And there's a lot of uh, different categories you can you can enter into and actually contribute to the science side of things and then there's the other main pillar which is uh, pretty pictures and videos and that's kind of what I do I just like the like I said before I just like the eye candy of it and I would consider the main categories here deep sky which are galaxies nebula clusters just uh, looking at objects far away from earth uh, outside our solar system and then planetary, which is everything inside our solar system. And then the uh, Milky Way nightscape, kind of the stuff that Adrian shared, uh, just looking at wide angle shots, maybe incorporating some uh, earth elements into those or some landscape elements. And then other subsets are, you know, solar imaging, imaging the moon, uh, other things in the solar systems like comets and asteroids and satellites. And then there's all these special events you can get into, eclipses, meteor showers, uh, certain alignments or other celestial events, and uh, beautiful aurora also. And I wow. you know, describe a little bit about the discipline of astrophotography. I underline discipline because it really is a lesson in um, patience and perseverance. You gotta have certain personality traits, uh, traits to really excel in the hobby and 
um, <clears throat> you know, namely just be a problem solver. You come up with all sorts of issues and, and problems when you're, when you're imaging the night sky. And so uh, understanding what your shortfall falls are, uh, what you can do to address those, that's just a key, a key trait uh, you can have to, to really push your imaging to the next level. I won't get into too deep into this. Um, like I said, this was a longer presentation, but I've just acquired a massive amount of equipment along the way. This is the stuff I use today uh, mainly to shoot the, the night sky, but I've got all sorts of uh, ancillary gear and uh, support equipment to go along with this. But I've, I've got a, about six main telescopes I use, uh, four mounts, and then a whole stable of dedicated astronomy cameras and, and DSLRs. I even use a GoPro from time to time. Software, as much equipment as I've gathered, uh, software is the whole other part of this. and. Uh, you really just have to be a little bit tech savvy to uh, get through all the software part of it, but there's tons of different um, specialized programs to, uh, to deal with certain issues and different types of imaging, you know, certain things for deep sky stacking and capture, certain things for planetary, again, uh, cap capturing and stacking, um, sharpening and and also planning, you know, planetarium software, uh, photo, uh, like Planet Pro is kind of a, a nightscape type of planning software. And also weather is a, is a huge thing. So I use uh, Astrospheric and other weather forecasting apps to get a handle on that. And the big factor we deal with um, Weather-wise uh, is one issue, but light pollution is another, and that's just purely location dependence. Um, and this is really just a, a thing to look out for if you're imaging deep sky or, or nightscape. So you wanna be in the as dark a sky as possible. And for me, living in Michigan, I just have to go north. Uh, for me, minimum two and a half hour drive to get to Bortle three or darker. So it's quite a production. So as I described above, the, the main pillars of astrophotography, the pretty picture side is deep sky, planetary, and nightscape. So I'll walk through a little bit of each of those. I don't have any permanent telescopes set up and I set up every night. So I really tailored my gear to uh, allow for that quick setup. And so I try to keep things in one piece as much as possible. So all I have to do is plop them down hook up data and power, pull our line, and then I'm kind of off to the races. I shoot with my computer inside and I run everything inside. And really the, the main focus there is just to keep things repeat, repeatable. Right. Yeah, look at that setup. Yeah, so this is my um, eight inch SCT and I've got a motorized focuser on the back guide cam with off-axis guider and then a, a monochrome filter camera wheel. with a filter wheel here yeah. sandwiched in between. That's quite a rig. Yeah, thanks. I This this is my uh, weapon of choice really for deep sky. I, I've used this setup for a number of years and I can't mm -hmm. see really changing it. I just really like the results I get. It's manageable for me since I do tend to carry things in one piece. If I wanted any larger, it would get heavy and unwieldy. So I mentioned before that the main problem with shooting deep sky from a suburban location is sky condition. And this is one of the worst nights I've, <laughs> one of the worst <laughs> scenarios imaginable, but really my telescope would continue to shoot through this because it's just light high clouds, but you can see how much the light pollution bounces off those clouds and it just makes the subframes garbage. So I really have to be careful to weed this stuff out when I go to stack the frames and mm -hmm. sometimes it's not so trivial. So I really rely a lot on software quality weighting 
and keeping tabs on the weather outside to know uh, when to shoot certain objects. I try to make sure I shoot them when they're high enough in the sky. But Adrian, you're showing all those nice, uh, beautiful Milky Way shots and you can see the band of the Milky Way behind these clouds. You can see just how much worse it is in Bortle Six Skies to get a look at the, uh, the Milky Way. So really how I take care of that is I just shoot tremendously long exposures and my typical deep sky shot will be in the 20, 30 to 40 hour range of exposure, just, just packing on a ton of exposure to average down that, that no noise signal. So this little video playing on the right hand side shows really how I collect pre-process process the data and um, kind of get to a final product. So single sub really doesn't look like much of anything, but you stretch that, you can begin to see nebulosity in the background. <clears throat> and by stacking hundreds of photos, the contrast comes out by virtue of reducing the noise. And then if you, you know, add the colorization by shooting through color filters, and remove the stars, you can see all that background nebulosity. So that's the flaming star and tadpole nebula in a wide field um, shot. Very cool. I love, I love that you're showing that process and um, you know, kind of guiding us through this whole thing. So many people dream of getting an image anywhere near what you're doing, Jason. Well, yeah, and, and see, I'm running through it in about 30 seconds but, right <laughs> you know the amount of work it takes to get to this point is, yeah 30 seconds for 30 years of uh you know right. journey here so but you know i get the question you know how do you make that photo well i mean these are the steps that go into it but each one each segment you see in this video is just a tremendous amount of i'll say sub steps <laughs> mm -hmm. so generally speaking i'll take all the subs I collect, all the subframes I collect, I'll quality weight those, they're aligned and then stacked and that gets rid of the noise and the defects. And then I you know, process them for detail using a process called deconvolution. Mm -hmm. And then all those master frames are combined into a full color image. And then I'll final, typically do final adjustments in Photoshop after all the pre-processing work. All right, so here we are in the uh, planetary. And again, I set up each night. I can't leave my planetary rig set up because it's just tremendously heavy. But this is a 12 inch Newtonian, which I've been using to uh, shoot planets uh, in recent years. And again, I control it off from the house, but this is the, the final imaging train um, consisting of a Teleview power mate to get some image ampl amplification, a filter wheel, then this is the ASI 183 camera. And again, uh, weather is a big factor. And really for planetary, it's all about seeing conditions. And up far in the north, it's pretty rare to get decent conditions. So that's something I really struggle with. And I end up only shooting planetary on the best of nights. And I shoot it in monochrome to get rid of issues with astro um atmospheric dispersion which again is a mm -hmm. is an issue if you're at a high latitude but i'll take multiple video files those are quality weighted stacked and then combined into a full color image and this kind of shows that process the raw stack ends up coming out looking a little bit blurry but it takes well to, sh to, to sharpening processes and that so this is a, a sharpening process called wavelets which takes it from the raw stack to a sharpened image and then combining the um, red green and blue channels you come up with a full color image wow and look at that stunning stunning image of saturn that's beautiful is this some of the um are these some of the uh kind of video clips that uh, you might share on social media as well these this, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm including here off to the side. And I'm I'm going to walk over here. I'm sorry to get. It's all right. My, um, you just walked back into the universe. So. 
Yeah, I'm trying to get a phone charger so I don't lose the audio again. <laughs> um, but all right. Um, yeah, I, I share these. You know, I've started to share a lot more video format online. Yeah, because um, a lot of the social media is kind of move into that. Yeah, but it lends its well itself well to these video uh, these presentation type things because you can kind of see the. You know, people like seeing things move. <laughs> it helps. Pictures worth a thousand words, but a video is worth a million. Yes. All right. So, um, you know, an offshoot of planetary is is lunar and solar. I do a lot of that work. Um, I've presented it on the Global Star Party plenty of times. We'll mm -hmm. see a little bit of more of that later. But I just want to move on to to Nightscape. Um, it's something I really enjoy doing. I don't get the chance to go out and do it much. But uh, I just love the blend of, you know, these natural landscape elements with the night sky. Um, Adrian presented a lot of beautiful work um, just a few minutes ago. But a little bit about, you know, how I shoot night sky is, uh, you know, I, I take really, really portable setups when I go out to do this. Because um, I like to get places that are, um, you know, maybe less accessible. Um, you know, find those good landscape elements and, and um, that adds a lot to the image. I use a Canon 6D. I've got this star tracker and, a, you know, just a lightweight tripod. What's that big yellow telephoto lens I see mounted on the, uh, the fence there? Yeah, that's a, that's a 16 ounce. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Energy drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, you know, like I said, it's my goal is to find those, those interesting um, foregrounds. was fortunate enough to get to Hawaii last oh, year, yeah. and this is from the top of Haleakala, so it doesn't mm. get more interesting than that, I think. But this is the big island of uh, Hawaii in the background. And I'll take typically, it depends on the darkness of the sky, but a few minute exposure uh, a series of those for the sky tracked and a series of those for the static foreground and blend those together in post-processing. So this just shows that um, I'll take, you know, this is three by uh, two minute sky exposures tracked. So the sky is crisp and then three by two minute static for the ground. So the ground is crisp and then those are blended together by masking the horizon line basically. And then you see at the bottom, that's the combined and processed yeah, final cool. image of yeah. that set of data. But definitely can do a lot by brightening, brightening things up. I mean, I think you'll notice by looking at the top two that they're a lot darker. Um, that's representative of what the scene actually looked like to the eye. And then the bottom is, you know, brightened up for that visual interest. Mm -hmm. Stunning. All right. So. Now I'll do a little bit of show and tell. Uh, I just have a series of uh, looking at space. Uh, this is the core of the Pac-Man Nebula. Um, so we'll go through a set of deep sky images um, that are some of my greatest hits or favorites. This is the Crescent Nebula, which is uh, the atmosphere of a Wolf Rayet star um, shed out in the red tones or the hydrogen. Uh, really interesting formation here where it's got kind of this tight web of hydrogen uh, enveloped by this envelope of um, the hydrogen, or sorry, the oxygen in the teal blue color. Just a real beautiful nebula in the heart of Cygnus. Oh, yeah. This is a hot off the presses one. This is a tiny little uh, nebula, not, not an uncommon one to see. Uh, through a telescope visually, although it typically just looks like a little blue disc. But a long exposure photograph uh, through a long focal length telescope and I was able to dig into a lot of the details in the core. And down below, I set my uh, image alongside of the Hubble Space Telescope image to show just really how far we can go with an amateur telescope um, as compared to a, amazing. a space telescope. Quite a difference in budget. Yes. <laughs> a little bit blurrier. <laughs> yeah. 
But nonetheless, uh, I mean, to me, it's breathtaking. It's, it is spectacular. Yeah, that, you know, yeah. something you don't really see in the Hubble Space Telescope images are the extended nebula that surround a planetary or a typical planetary will have a bright core with this extended shell around it. So that's something I really tried to do by bringing out the, um, the faint hydrogen and oxygen yeah, layers out in the distance, and that really takes a lot of exposure. So this is almost a thirty-hour exposure image. All right, you got a struble in on this one, and yeah. as somebody who's observed a blue snowball a few times, and it just looks like a blue snowball, this uh, blows my mind. Here, I, I stepped back on right quick, and I saw this, and you know, this is Not something beautiful. we can't see visually, and um, it's great. It's I think the first time I've seen what the interior of the blue snowball looks like. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. kudos to all those hours just to get that. It's, uh, it's inspiring to see exactly what it is. I know the course HST, you got pretty darn close. You got all the same data, maybe not the same precision, but then again, you're not running an observatory above earth. So. Yeah. You don't have a 90 inch telescope in, in space. Right. Maybe, maybe and someday. Yet, <laughs> and yet, but yeah, that's just, That'll be your <laughs> save That'll your be my, my GoFundMe. Uh, yeah. But uh, just with what, like you said, with what you've got, you've got an amazing image. It took a lot of time. I mean, it, this isn't this isn't something you can just take a snapshot of two hours later. Ooh, look what I got! It takes a lot of time and some dedication to do it. So, yeah. hats off. So you'll notice a trend here with what I shoot with this telescope is I try to put a lot of hours on target and that's, you know, mainly just to get the light pollution uh, squared away. But also as I do try to hammer into these details and by quality weighting the subframes, I can pick the best ones to stack. And, and so that's what I, I tend to do also. And this is uh, NGC 4490, which is the cocoon galaxy and its companion. This is an interacting galaxy pair and really just a, a beautiful um, web of hydrogen surrounding these galaxies. And that's just because of the creation of stars uh, due to these galaxies passing through each other. This is the Wizard Nebula shot uh, with the Explore Scientific AR-152 in narrow band. Wow, wow. So, that's an Acromat telescope. I I use um, narrowband filters to you know, shoot deep sky through it. That is, who would have thought that you could do that with an Acromat? I mean, really, that was something, an image like this would have been impossible to do not too many years ago. So with an Acromat system. It's fun, fun stuff. Uh, this is a wide angle shot uh, with a telescope called the TPO Ultra Wide, which is a little um, telescope not bigger than a can of Red Bull. It's uh, 180 millimeter focal length. So the field of view you see here is about five degrees wide by seven and a half degrees tall. It's quite a substantial field. And um, again, shot from my backyard. So I had to use a lot of exposure time to pull out this dark nebula. In the center, you see the dark shark and down below is what I call the space penguin, although it's upside down here, but it's a uh, Bernard 175. And the hmm. red strand running through it is actually an ancient supernova remnant. And uh, above oh. that with the, in the more magenta and blue Teal color is a, a small planetary nebula. So just a lot of different type of nebula, nebulae going on in this image. I really enjoy shooting these wide angles to, to get to see all these. The scale of this, yeah. Yeah, no yeah. nebulae and how they relate to each other in the sky. Yeah. Quick question for you. How long are your exposures? Um, for this telescope, I use two-minute broadband and four-minute narrow band okay so yeah i i was able to get two minutes unguided on my little bitty california and pleiades uh shot but i only did an hour's worth um so 
what this is showing me is it just takes a lot of time. It, yeah, it, yeah, you just got to put a lot of time into it. Yeah. This is M76, the little dumbbell nebula. This one was interesting, I thought, because it's got also a red giant star in the frame. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are two future stages of, of sun-like stars. It really is a, an example of All the right. progression of our sun. Yeah, the, the little dumbbell's unrecognizable at this exposure. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it looks like a butterfly now. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> doesn't look, I don't see the dumbbell shape anymore. That's that's really amazing. Uh, this is NGC eight ninety one, which is a beautiful edge on spiral galaxy, mm. uh, one of the largest in this orientation in our sky. But what I really loved about this image is all the dust lane detail that came out of the final exposure. And this is really the same, you know, this is kind of like how we see the Milky Way. If we were to step back, you know, a few thousand light, a few million light years, we see the whole galaxy come into view. But, we, you know, the band is, is pretty similar to how we see the Milky Way in the sky. Yeah, and it's like 30 million light years away. And this is uh, Messier 1, the Crab Nebula. I shot this one through... Um, a near infrared filter to pull out the pulsar wind nebula in the core. And that's what you see in blue and purple. Wow. And then the hydrogen cage is, is around it. But that's by using that near infrared that. filter, I was able to isolate and actually get some of the disc of the, the uh, pulsar wind nebula. And the pulsar is actually down here in the center and there there's polar jets coming out of both sides, but it's a really, just exotic object. Then the deeper you push in, the more crazy it looks. All right, so planetary, uh, we got a Mars opposition coming up. So I threw this image of Mars from our last opposition in. Um, one of my favorite images I've taken. I'm really looking forward to kind of getting back into this one in the coming months. I think mid-December is Mars opposition, so it's coming up. This is Jupiter from a few weeks ago. Well, one of my better shots through the 12 inch Newtonian. Uh, Venus through the uh, AR 152 shot in near infrared, green, and UV. So this is an extended spectrum, and that's what allows us to see variations in the cloud deck. I've, Looking, uh, looking forward to Venus being well positioned again to get back into shooting it. It's, it's tough to get it. Uh, you have to kind of shoot it when it's at a maximum elongation. And right now it's buried in the sunlight. So, uh, yeah, more it's to a come spectacular on Venus shot though. And this is a cool little video I put together because I've shot Saturn for so many years now. This is an eight year cycle of the rings of Saturn. The plate in sequence, you can see the rings tilt to their maximum and then come back. And uh, just in a few years, it's time it's going to be back to uh, edge on with the rings. So I'll keep adding to this video as I can. That's very cool. What a jewel. All right, Scott, I'm pushing over my time here. I have a few more categories, but I don't want to, I can hop through them really quick, but um, just just examples of where you can go with astrophotography. And uh, this is the sun in calcium light, which is a deep ultraviolet. This is in hydrogen alpha light, where you can see the fluffy chromosphere come into view. And a fun thing to do with solar imaging is the time-lapsing. So you can see the uh, Certain features dance. Uh, fun thing to look at here are the prominences. And lunar, just for you, Adrian, I got a mineral moon here. <laughs> this is where you saturate the colors deeply to show the different uh, mineralogy of the moon. Uh, the colors of the that come out here are the differences in the regolith. 
and this one's especially for you. This is a, a composite of um, multiple images to, sh to produce uh, clear earth shine with the well-exposed uh, bright side and then a star field in the background. It's more of an impression of, of what the moon looks like to the naked eye, although it goes a little bit further than that and uh, reveals some details you can't see with the naked eye. Comet uh, time-lapsing is fun to see things move real time. That's something we don't really get to see very often. So we got, uh, that was Atlas. This is Neowise from a couple of years ago. I really just wanted to get to this next slide before I, I um, wrap it up here. Right. <laughs> but um, a few weeks ago, NASA crashed the DART spacecraft into Diamorphos. And I was able to get a video of that sailing through the sky. And by stacking the frames, I was able to actually see the what amounts to a cometary tail coming off of Dimorphos. Thought it was a really cool uh, wow. time lapse to be able to produce. Yeah, that's very cool. So the single frames don't show the tail. Um, it's very faint. Um, you can see it slightly, but as you stack the 150 some odd frames that I shot, then the, the, the noise is reduced and the tail becomes visible. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, I can uh, drop it off here, Scott, unless you want to keep going. But I, yeah, I hope it just I know that we could. Some of the um, passion I have yeah. for doing this stuff and all the possibilities that exist within astrophotography. Yeah. More for next time. More for next yeah. time. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. You're welcome. That's great. And I know that you made a huge effort to come on tonight. So thank you very much for that. And um, and hopefully we'll see you next week or the week after. So, um, but that's that's great. That's great. Right, so, uh, and thanks for making tonight work as well <laughs> because uh, of the technical uh, difficulty. But uh, there's always a way to make it. There's always Plan B. So, yeah. Yep. Well, thank you. Great. All righty. Okay. So um, we are going to take a short break. Um, and um, head off to um, um, uh, our next speaker will be young Navin uh, uh, Sintel Kumar, uh, who's going to be talking about smart telescopes. Up after that is Ilias Jaffer, which is um, uh, Kareem Jaffer's son. Uh, he's going to talk about spectroscopy at Mount Wilson Observatory. Marcello Souza is due to come on Cesar Brollo. Uh, from Argentina, John Johnson from the Nebraska Star Party. He'll be sharing some special news with us. Um, Nico uh, uh, will not be able to join us because, well, hammer time with Nico kind of indicates he's a drummer and they are having an extended long band rehearsal, so we'll have to forgive him for that. Um, and, uh, and then we also have Maxi Filares on as well. I will include uh, a special video that was uh, uh, recorded actually for Starmus uh, with Doug Struble, who you heard uh, people talk about earlier in this program, and Chuck Ayub uh, of the famous Chuck's Astrophotography. They made this beautiful video together about uh, how they overcome uh, light pollution to make the incredible images that they do. Uh, you know, Jason Gonzell is one of those guys as well. So. Uh, let's just take a few minutes and then Navin, you are up next. So here we go.
glass looks good. Yeah. No cracks on the screen. Seems okay. Uh, wow. I don't think that uh, they'll be putting any people <laughs> in a hard crash like that. But uh, uh, I think it's more or less designed for, you know, just another way to get some equipment, maybe food, um, uh, maybe not so sensitive instrumentation. Although that iPhone did survive uh, uh, that impact. So, uh, you know, it's amazing what they're doing over at NASA. Uh, you know, because we are uh, no doubt getting ready to um, try to put boots on Mars one day. So lots of, lots of little problems need to be worked out. Not, not so many little ones, some really big ones too. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I want to say uh, the presentations that we've had uh, so far in Global Star Party have just been nothing short of amazing. Um, and uh, something I was uh, uh, remiss in showing. David, are you still uh, are you still awake back there? Not sure. I think he's listening in. But uh, David was showing something to us that was uh, uh, really special. And um, uh, so, if I can get him to come on a little bit later, we'll uh, we'll do that. But uh, for right now, uh, I would like to. Um, uh, reintroduce uh, young Navin uh, Santel Kumar, uh, who is going to talk about smart telescopes, which is, you know, um, uh, something that uh, smart telescopes have been around for a while, but uh, they're starting to come of age where you're able to buy like complete packages. Uh, Explore Scientific is now selling something called the Unistellar, uh, which is a kind of an all-in-one, uh, what they call an EV scope or yeah. uh, electronically assisted uh, uh, telescope. And uh, it does imaging, it does everything all-in-one. So, but uh, Navin will tell you more about these things. All yours, Navin. So, hi everyone, I'm Naveen Sandhagumar. I'm gonna be talking about um, smart telescopes. So, yeah. So what are smart? Okay, first, let me just go to slideshow. So what is a smart telescope? Smart telescopes, also known as a robotic telescope, they're a totally brand new category of digital smart robotic telescopes that can you can control from your smartphone or tablet or any other mobile device. Use, they use integrated image sensors, software, and um, optics to deliver unique and compelling experiences in all simple and all-in-one efficient packages. So now let's get into the perp, how, why they're here. So they're basically using cutting edge technology to locate faint objects um, and basically take long exposure images of them, stacking them one on top of each other to remove noise and also battle the problem of light pollution and also to Im improve the image quality. Some of them also have onboard light pollution filters built in. So these are the parts of the filter, the first, sorry, the telescope. They have an onboard computer, which is a mini PC built in there within system, um, their mirror, like this is a unistellar EV scope. It's a reflector telescope, so it's just going through. And then they have a sensor right here to pick up the, all that light. And then they have an integrated battery that's rechargeable and stuff, and yeah. It has up to 12 hours of range, I think, for astronomy, yeah. How do these things work? So first thing it does, it identifies where it's pointed in the sky, uses plate solving, or like uses like two star alignment or what, or like something like that. It, it like 
analyze analyzes star patterns using an algorithm to find its um target, and then it proceeds to take a series of long high exposure photographs while rotating to compensate the movement of the Earth. So they're kind of like an equatorial mount where you're like tracking the rotation of the Earth. It's a similar concept to that. Oh, okay. So now let's talk about some telescopes that are available on the market. So the first thing that Scott was talking about earlier on the, that they also sold in Explore Scientific is the Unistellar EV scope. Um, they also have an Equinox of this. Um, and then there's the Vionis. There's a um, Vionis. They're another company. They have this, this telescope called the Stolina. Um, and this one is also from Vionis. It's called the Vespara. You might also want to search these up. They're pretty nice ones. So now let's talk about my smart telescope. I currently have, this is also my newest telescope. And this is my newest edition. We just recently got this one. This is the Unistellar Equinox. Um, we recently got this, so we're still testing it out, trial and error, doing stuff so, with it, so yeah. Um, I'm gonna show you some of my images I took with it. So this is my first image. This is M33 Triangulum Galaxy. This is a 14 minute exposure. And then it, here it just shows the lat latitude and lang longitude and latitude, and it shows the date that it was taken. And I think this isn't this isn't this is not processed yet. Okay, so now we're gonna see see a raw image and a processed image. This is currently the Helix Nebula. This is a much more better thirty eight minute exposure. It was taken on this. It was taken a bit earlier. Um, now we process, my dad processes through Photoshop. Um, and it has, it, it has a little bit more improved image quality as you see here. Now I'm going to talk about some of my outreach I've done. I, uh, this was back in September. It was a Novak event at CM Crockett. I just went around helping around the tents and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I was, it was a good night and we had a lot of stuff. So these were some Milky shots, Milky Way shots that were taken there through smartphone. And not, yeah, so ooh, you can see the Milky Way a little bit here. Yeah. And then I don't, this is also the Milky Way I think here, it's supposed to be. So yeah. I took the Swan Nebula and the Eagle Nebula through a smartphone, through a reflector, which this one was pretty cool because it had a rifle, an illuminated rifle scope that was custom built, I think, or custom bought. I don't know. Yeah, so like it, it was taken through an iPhone 13 Pro Max. So we ended up with the Swan Nebula, I think this is, and the Eagle Nebula, which this is. Um, so yeah, we came out with that. Wow. These are, and also these are not processed. These are raw images. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Also part of its image quality, well, it's much better because it's, it, it uses the illuminated rifle scope, which is night vision. So it's really, it has much more lighting added onto it. So that, that contributes to that. <clears throat> so now this is all the ring nebulae taken from the same telescope in the same smartphone. So, yeah. Now, smart telescopes, they're fast. They got firmware updates. They need firmware updates frequently. And they have a pretty good real resolution. They just lack detail and contrast. And it's not that good. So, yeah, that's all. This is my presentation. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much. Are you uh, are you enjoying using the telescope, or how do you find it? You could, you can find it in um, all the usual astronomy like retailers such as High Point, yeah. 
places like that. And I think you guys were also selling it on Explore Scientific, EBScope. Yes, uh -huh. we've become their distributor here in the <laughs> USA. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, are you enjoying using the telescope? I yeah, mean... it's a pretty good telescope so far. Okay. It's a Excellent. really worth it model. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're having fun with it. And I look forward to seeing more work with it. That's great. It's also really portable, though. It's like... Right. Very, I mean, and, you know, uh, not only portable, but um, uh, it's uh, especially the model that has the eyepiece, uh, the way I've seen it used by people who do out astronomy outreach is they'll be there with other telescopes that they'll be running the, the Unistellar in, in combination with other telescopes. And this just adds like a, another it's like having another astronomer there with you, you know, so uh, as you're looking through, they look through the eyepiece and start to see uh, what looks kind of like a blue gray image and then it's tracking and stacking in as you described and then pretty soon you're seeing color uh, in a nebula and so that's that's really amazing stuff. Just for uh, my advice, like for like beginners, these, these telescopes are great for you. They're like really nice. All you need is a smartphone a mobile device and it like gets you started for it and also for unistellar they have a citizen science program which is like contributing to like finding like galaxies and stuff and they've partnered up with seti so that's a thing to look forward to and you can participate in that so yeah great thank you, great. Thank you so much thank you so up next is um uh ilias uh jaffer uh ilias is uh uh, the son of Kareem Jaffer, who's been on our show many times. But uh, uh, when I was at Mount Wilson, I was happy to learn that he was up there, I think, just before I got up there uh, with the, um, uh, the undergraduate study program that they have going on at Mount Wilson uh, to do spectroscopy. And I think that you were pretty involved in that. So thank you uh, for coming on to the show. And... Um, uh, Love your time, man. It's good. So, <laughs> anyways, I'm gonna let you have the stage, Ilias. Thank you for coming on. Uh, uh, I don't think I had a chance to meet you before, um, but um, uh, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the uh, the undergraduate uh, program at Mount Wilson. Yeah, for sure. So the uh, summer, uh, sorry, it's called the SOAR, the Summer Observational Astrophysics Retreat. And it's not just for undergraduates. Uh, oh, okay. um, they've, they've had people as young as 18, and I think as old as uh, like, uh, I think 40 year, year olds hmm. uh, attend. So it's, it's, um, it's really about getting to, uh, uh, to be more hands on with astronomy. Uh, it, it was quite the fun experience. And uh, so um, uh, about end of August, uh, I gave a uh, presentation about uh, my experience at uh, Mount Wilson um, mm. for the uh, Montreal uh, RASC, uh, which is still up on their YouTube channel if you'd like to go see that. Uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give today is a bit more focused uh, because I intend to present this at the uh, uh, CUPC, which is the Canadian Undergraduate Physics Conference, which is happening in Guelph uh, this weekend. Oh, great. Great. Well, thank yeah. you for, again, thank you for coming on. And uh, I know your dad's watching right now. Probably your whole family's watching. So hello to them. Okay. And, and thanks again. We're really proud to have you on the program. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll begin by, uh, uh, is, is my screen visible? It is. All right. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, I'll begin by just giving a brief overview of uh, what the experience was like. So uh, we were up in uh, the mountains of California, Mount Wilson, which is about a five hour drive from uh, Los Angeles. Um, and uh, here you can, in the middle, you can kind of see a map of the area. Um, uh, here on the top right, these are the, this is the monastery where we were staying. Um, and uh, yeah, we got to see some, uh, uh, see some pretty interesting instruments. This was the 60-inch uh, uh, reflector. This is the 150-foot solar tower. This is the uh, snow solar telescope. Uh, that one is really cool because uh, a, a lot of the stuff is done manually, uh, 
which is quite fun. And uh, this one over here is the 100 foot reflector. Uh, so uh, yeah, lo lots of amazing things to, to see and do. Um, but uh, for this presentation, I'm going to focus more on the research that I got to do in the second half uh, of the uh, retreat. So how it works is the first week, uh, we get to learn a ton about astronomy. Uh, and then uh, that weekend, uh, we uh, uh, draft up and submit a proposal uh, for a research project to do the next week uh, with some of the instruments uh, over there. So, um, uh, yeah, so the uh, project that I decided to work on uh, involves spectroscopy. So uh, for those people who are not quite aware of uh, what spectroscopy is, um, basically, when you've got uh, an electron that's around an atom that gets excited um, and then gets uh, uh, goes back to its initial state, it will emit uh, a certain uh, a certain wavelength of photon um, that is characteristic to that atom. And the same thing can happen if light passes through it, that same wavelength is what it will absorb. So uh, uh, spectroscopy is basically looking for uh, either what light uh, uh, was emitted or what light was absorbed. Now, the problem with looking for molecules is that you don't just get a line, uh, you instead get a band. So, um, uh, because the uh, electronic structure of a molecule is more complicated. Um, so instead, um, uh, when we look, um, when we look at uh, the spectrum and we're looking for molecules, we'll see a uh, uh, kind of uh, drop down and then it kind of tapers back up because there's a whole range of uh, of wavelengths that are emitted. But um, the main wavelength that's emitted is called the band head. And that is the one where you'll see the strongest decrease. So um, uh, yeah, basically my project here was to look at the spectra of uh, of cooler stars and see if I could detect the presence of titanium oxide and uh, if I could find uh, that cooler stars have uh, uh, higher, uh, uh, have more absorption uh, in their tit uh, titanium oxide, uh, uh, w uh, the wavelengths that you would expect for titanium oxide. So um, this is kind of the setup. Uh, so uh, we used a 16 inch, uh, I used a 16 inch telescope um, uh, equipped with this spectrograph uh, and a uh, photometry camera uh, whose specs are written there. Um, now, in order to uh, take the data accurately, uh, we had to take uh, 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 darks and lamps as well. So what, what those are is, uh, so each camera uh, is has uh, like its intricacies uh, and uh, in order to remove like the peculiarities of that uh, specific camera, what we'll do is, uh, depending on what exposure we're taking, uh, we'll uh, shut off all the light to the uh, to the camera, so cl close the telescope, and then just take that long of an exposure and see what pixels are hot. And so once we have our actual data, we'll be able to subtract those. Um, now, lamps are uh, slightly different. Uh, for lamps, uh, we use uh, emission spectra uh, of known atoms uh, to ca basically calibrate our image. So uh, here you can see uh, uh, this is the uh, um, the lamp that uh, I got uh, for uh, the star fi uh, 57 Pisces. Um, so uh, uh, the lamp that we used is a mercury argon lamp. So you get the lines that you expect for mercury and argon. Uh, and you take a lamp before and after to see if there was any drift uh, that you have to account for for like uncertainties and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, finally, wh when we're focusing the telescope uh, for the uh, course focus, you always want to go in the same direction because there's some backlash with the gears. Um, but when you're doing the fine focus, because it was a friction drive, uh, we were fine to go either way. And uh, uh, we use what's called full width half max to determine wh whether uh, our instrument is in focus or not, which means uh, looking at an object. Um, taking the brightest pixel, uh, going at half that and seeing what the spread is. And you want to diminish that spread as much as you can in order to get a more focused image. Um, so uh, this is a full width half, uh, half max curve that you see here on my slide. Um, so yeah, uh, basically uh, what I do with this lamp is uh, I take the sums of the uh, columns vertically and uh, just move that into Excel. 
And then in Excel, mm -hmm. I can see where the peaks are. And because I'm using mercury and argon, I know what the wavelengths I'm expecting uh, uh, these emission wavelengths to be. So I can um, use those to kind of get a graph uh, to correlate a uh, pixel number with the wavelength. Um, and that then allows me to take my actual data and uh, know which wavelengths I'm looking at given which pixels are hotter. Um, and here you can see that the precision is kind of high. Uh, that is because instead of just using the uh, brightest pixel, uh, the, the peak pixel there, uh, I instead uh, uh, took a certain range and then did the centroid uh, to get like a weighted average, uh, just to, to be more precise. Um, now, uh, once I take the actual data, this is what it looks like. So it's an exposure over a certain amount of time. And there is some like drift that you can see, but it doesn't matter because we're taking the sums over the columns. So, uh, 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 ah, yes, uh, there is some correcting to do, however, uh, due to something called instrument response. So each instrument, uh, because the light is passing through that being recorded, um, well, the instrument will respond to different wavelengths slightly differently. So what we have to do first is take the spectrum of a uh, star whose spectrum is known so that we can then, uh, uh, so here is the spectrum I took for a star called Alfeca. Um, and uh, I knew the, uh, uh, like in, the, in our database, there was the spectrum for Alfeca. So we could correct that to see uh, what the instrument's response was. And here there's a few irregularities because our uh, spectrum in the database um, didn't take into account the lines of absorption from our Earth's atmosphere. But uh, once we take that and kind of smooth it out, then we get this approximate instrument response curve that we can use to uh, calibrate our data. Um, uh, so here is one of my uh, original data, and here is what it looks like after it's been calibrated using this instrument response curve, which I generated using this software called ISIS. Um, now, uh, you can see at the end here, it tapers off. That's just because that's where my instrument response curve ends, but that doesn't matter because this region over here is where the data I'm actually looking for is. So all's good there. Um, so uh, once I did that and I uh, uh, normalized these spectra and plotted them on the graphs, you can kind of see how, uh, so uh, K2 star Arcturus is the hottest one that I looked at, and uh, uh, V1351 Cygni uh, is an M star, so it's 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 on the cooler side. Um, and you can see how when you're going uh, from the hotter at the bottom to the cooler on the top, you can see that drop from titanium oxide more uh, uh, more obviously. And that is kind of what we were expecting. But uh, I wanted to quantify this. So uh, I went on Excel um, and used the uh, uh, ratio between the highest pixel and the, the lowest pixel of that drop uh, to uh, uh, quantifiably uh, determine uh, uh, by, uh, the strength of this absorption line. Uh, and uh, doing so uh, yielded this graph, which follows the, the theory that I was uh, expecting it to, which was uh, published in this uh, article of the uh, 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 American Association of Variable Star Observers Journal, um, uh, which is that uh, when the temperature of a given star is cooler, the opacity of titanium oxide increases, and thus the titanium oxide uh, absorption lines are more prominent. And um, uh, uh, to discuss a little bit the, the theory about why we'd expect the opacity to increase is because in like really hot stars, there's so much energy that the bonds for any molecules to uh, to exist would be broken immediately. But titanium oxide can exist in slightly cooler stars because they won't break those bonds immediately, which is uh, basically what I was looking for and was thankfully able to find. Uh, so uh, I consider my experiment to be a success. Um, so I'd like to give a big thanks to uh, Dr. Paula Turner, uh, Robert Buchheim, uh, John Hoot, uh, Patricia Hill, uh, uh, and Thomas Meneghini from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, they, they ran an amazing program. It was a, a ton of fun. Uh, I'd also like to thank my uh, CJF physics teacher, Caroline Vigée, for writing me the uh, reference letter to apply to this program, and uh, RASC Montreal for uh, uh, for helping get me into astronomy and giving me a lot of the background that helped me, uh, uh, that helped me. So, um, 
uh, in case any of you are interested, uh, now that the main part of my presentation is over, this is kind of what the schedule looked like uh, during the, the retreat. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to uh, uh, discussing or comments uh, or questions, uh, how, however you want to do this. Uh, how did how did you feel about the program in general? I mean, it seems like you learned a lot. Um, uh, you obviously came prepared, um, you know, uh, to work with your data. Um, uh, how much did you learn at the at the uh, conference versus how much how pre, pre prepared were you? I mean, Oh, I, I, I learned a lot that I didn't know before. Like, like mm -hmm. I, uh, after that first week, I came out feeling like, because it, it felt as if I took like uh, a whole course, because there, there, there's, there, there's so much that you get to learn by just doing the stuff hands on, because every morning we would go up to the snow solar telescope, and we'd get to do some solar observing. Every night we'd go to the 16 inch some uh, and then one night we got to use the 60 inch one night the 100 inch, uh, and uh, do the observing learn about the different parts of observing and then these classes that you see during the day, we got to learn about a whole bunch of different uh, 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 interesting concepts in uh, uh, solar and stellar and spe uh, spectral uh, uh, astrophotography. Um, so it is, uh, uh, and like uh, like the data manipulation and what right. what these different uh, things mean. Uh, it, it was absolutely a phenomenal experience. Yeah. Well, you basically had what a hundred plus years of uh, of um, experience from Mount Wilson being imparted to you. Uh, I have to ask you, I mean, uh, I've been to Mount Wilson many times. I used to be uh, one of the guys, one of the volunteers up there that took care of one of the telescopes, um, one of the small telescopes up there. Um, how did you feel being at Mount Wilson where so much history was made? Oh, it was, it was, it was such a great feeling. Like, um, I, basically, you, you, it was imposing, but it was also really inviting. Like it was inviting uh, uh, the the fact that that there was uh, I mean Mount Wilson is where uh, uh, Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe and so it's it's inviting you to keep looking to yeah. to, to to you know just to, to 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 stay curious to keep asking questions to keep uh, uh, to, to to keep looking into into this that and and just discover um, and mm -hmm. I, I I really enjoyed that. That's great. That's great. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that look at Mount Wilson like it's an antique. It is old, uh, but they look at it as an antique. They look at it as a museum piece, something like that. Uh, but this is an instrument you can still do. Res these are instruments you can still do research with. Oh, very much. You know, very much. and they have yes. also the uh, Curea uh, uh, interferometry program going on there as well from I think it's um, uh, I think it's University of Georgia is running that um, but uh, uh, you know I uh, I always felt that the, that uh, the history or that that feeling of being there where all those astronomers were you know from Hubble to Shapley to you know Bada to you know, it just goes on and on uh, when you walk up to the 60 inch telescope i'm sure you saw the lockers uh for for hubble yes. and all those other people still there that's not a prop those are the real lockers that they use yes uh so that, it's, that, um, that was that was fascinating and uh i don't have it uh, in this uh, slide deck but i also uh i, I didn't get to, uh, to take a picture on the actual uh um, bridge even though i passed on it um mm -hmm. but uh from the uh a hundred inch dome. Uh, I took a picture of that bridge, uh, and uh, there is a picture uh, floating around on the internet of uh, Einstein and uh, uh, and a bunch yeah. of the Mount Wilson people right. uh, standing on that bridge. Yeah, so, I failed to mention Einstein. So that's uh, right. That's right. He was yeah, there. And uh, that car interferometer uh, you spoke about here on the map, you can see the different uh, parts of it. Uh, I didn't actually get to go see that because. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm guessing there was uh, stuff going on, but I got to see it from the outside, and it it it's quite impressive. Yes, right. Well, I'm glad you went. Uh, do you plan to go back at any time, or is this some uh, kind of a one and done type of deal? Or 
if I get the opportunity again, I'd love to. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ilias. And um, again, uh, 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 you know, regards to your father, who's normally, uh, who's appeared on Global Star Party many times, but you are also welcome to come back at any time to share your, uh, you know, your new adventures in astronomy. So thank you so much. Thank you. So, so Ilias, just to let you know, I told your father what a wonderful mm -hmm. presentation that you did global star party and uh he sent back a little love icon so so he's uh he's sent his approval yeah a great yeah. job i can see you're following in his footsteps of uh yeah. you know of astronomy and hope it goes hope it goes even further for you than it, you know as it does for your father who's uh, uh he's responsible for me joining the rask so you know, his outreach continues. I, I wish you nothing but success as you continue learning um, all these things. So excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I, I got to learn a ton. And so hopefully uh, with this new knowledge and the software from uh, John Hoot, uh, I'll be able to do some more stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. yes. So John Hoot uh, wrote the software. Oh, yeah, yes. He, he is an old friend. So that's great. All right. Um, okay, so we are going to uh, make a transition um, and go to um, Brazil to uh, visit with Professor Marcello Souza. Uh, Marcello is, uh, is always up to some new program in astronomy outreach with his students. And um, uh, so it's been a couple of months. It'll be great to catch up. Marcello, how are you? Hi. I'm fine. Nice to see you again. It's great yes, to it's great to see my old friend. All of you again. It's a great <laughs> pleasure to be here. Yes. Wonderful. And, and in this period, we had the opportunity to organize many new activities here. And tomorrow, we will have a special event that we will have the participation of the a representative of the consulate of United States here in Rio de Janeiro, that will be the the event that for the close we will go to close the the project that we developed during one year in schools here in our region. And I will share now the results that we got uh, with the development of this project. And for us, it was a fantastic experience. I hope you can see the screen. Let me see if we, I share. I share you the see screen. It's starting to share. Oh, okay, okay. And my computer, sorry. <laughs> my computer sometimes. Uh, here I say that it's not answered. But I, I will talk until. Ah, I think that's shared now. Yes. Yes, yes, it is here. And uh, we, in the spirit, we had the, the opportunity to participate in an event in Santa Maria Madalena. Mm -hmm. That was an event in the city, uh, where it's located the headquarter of the, the state park of Desengano, that is the first dark sky park in Latin America. Uh, here is our group, and here is a my friend that is responsible for the presentations in the uh, mobile planetarium. Okay. Yeah, we were there. And a lot of people participated. It's a small city with 10,000 people that live there. It's a, and the, we organized the solar observations, uh, the observation of the sky at night, and the, with the, and we helped the, the Carlos, that is from the Astronomy Museum, with the sessions of in the planet the mobile planetarium. That was a big success here. And you had a lot of people with us observing the sky in a lot during the day. The sky we have clouds, but uh, during the afternoon it was possible to observe the, the sun. And it was a big success in this city. It's a small city now that is only talking about astronomy <laughs> because of the recognition of the park. And here are the team, our group, 
and also the responsibles in the city. The, this person here that I don't know if you see my my mouse here, but he, this guy that is my side, he is the owner of a hotel in this city. And he that he is the person that is responsible for everything that's happened there. I, I was there with my wife to stay for a weekend. And then I talked with him. And a few months later, I and our group organized the first astronomy event in this city. And then after this, we organized other events. And now the city has the first dark sky park in Latin America. And something that is amazing and is different from what we expect, he has, he has problems with his eyes and he can't see uh, in the telescopes, the images. But even with the difficulties he has, he supported astronomy events in the city. And here is our project, Young Stars of Tomorrow. That uh, was a fantastic experience. He, these are the group, this is our group. Uh, Mm -hmm. We have nine students that receive a scholarship. Wow. That, that is paid by the uh, United States Consulate in Rio de Janeiro. Oh, that's during, great. During one year, we have four university students and five fundamental students from fundamental schools and high schools that have scholarships. Here is all the team. Uh, in one of the meets, we have meetings all the week. Uh, and the, this was the first activity in schools in the end, at the end of September 2021. Uh, that's when we began, uh, September 30, 20, hmm. 2021, was the first activity in school on the project. We distribute many gifts for the students who receive the support for Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy to give the solar glasses né? to the students who receive the support from the United States Consulate to give gifts from NASA for the students. And I also have your support here. Scott. Thank you very much to announce the event. Oh, thank have you. Thank also you. It's been in, an honor. It's and you, part you participate in one of the a video conference with the students as part of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. And here, a part of the event that I organized, you can see here, these schools are located, most of them far from the center of the cities, in regions where the students don't have any kind of equipment, any kind of support. And then we had the opportunity to visit the schools and talk with these students. This was the most important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them from public schools here in Brazil. And uh, it was an unforgettable experience. You can see here, this is in front of one of the schools. We have farms in front of the school. And uh, near the, in the middle of the farms, we have one school there. And they need, uh, they need to go in a scholar bus because they live far from the school. Uh -huh. Here, a uh, part of our experience, this is a, a magazine, uh, a school, and, sorry, a newspaper about the 50 years of the Apollo 11 mission that we gave more than almost 600 newspapers for the students. Oh, that's excellent. That's great. Yeah, they will talk about Sometimes we have a lot of students in the schools. Here, we have more than 100 students in these activities. And uh, how work is this? We give to the students this notebook, the challenge notebook, you know, about uh, how to, to develop a mission to the moon. And uh, at the end, in the first day, at the end of the first day of activity, we ask the student to make a project to send an astronaut, three astronauts to the moon 
and to build a base on the moon. These are the results that we received from the students. We choose the best projects and you give a prize for the students that develop the best project. And uh, we develop activities in six cities. We had the opportunity to visit 56 public schools. We developed activity in 56 public schools, something that uh, we didn't expect that you have. Uh, we, have uh, we began during the pandemic period. Then we didn't imagine that it was possible to visit so many schools and develop a, a project in so many schools in only one year of project. And you had participation of more than 1,800 students in this project. That was something fantastic. These are the events that were organized during the, the project. These are the moments that we give certi certificate for the students that participate as scholar with scholarships. Here are an event in the biggest theater of the city. Here have the participation here of the representative of the consulate, United States consulate here in Rio de Janeiro. Here are all the team involved in the project. And these are images of the observation of the total lunar eclipse that we have in the first semester of 2022. We organize events in nine places at the same time. It was a fantastic experience for us. And here are the visits of Gabe Gabriel here. That's great. We had you know, Marcello, I, I remember I, how, how um, excited and anxious the kids are in Brazil to learn more about astronomy and science. Uh, you know, it is... Uh, you know, and you really feel their interest and you, you feel their passion, you know, and being that you've done this for so many years, um, you know, I know that you've seen young people grow up to be adults and to go on. Do you think it's beneficial in their lives? Do you think that uh, that they go on to better careers? And Yes, I have. In our group, we have two students now that they are doing they are in master course here in university. Oh, that's great. We have yeah. two students that finish the PhD. We have one of the students that now are finishing the PhD in Canada. We have in the many places that I go, someone meets me and say that they choose his career or her career after mm -hmm. the participation in our events. Something oh, that that's great. We organize events for 26 years already. Yeah, yeah, we began yeah. in 1996. That's a have... lot of work and it makes it all worthwhile. It does. Yes, we have three generations already in our, in our group. One of the, the students that participated in the beginning as a, a child, now she gave classes in university here in our city. Then, uh, is a fantastic opportunity for these students mm -hmm. because uh, I would like to have this opportunity when I was a kid. I only had the opportunity to observe in a telescope when I was in my in the university. Only then, now we have students from here that they can see, we go to telescopes in every place here and give this opportunity to, to them. And you see that they like this because Gabe Gabriel stayed here du during one week. We had the participation of more than 1,500 students wow. in, in his presentations here. Okay. You can see here in the theater here, uh, in all the places, a lot of people participating yes. in, in the presentations. Then it was a fantastic experience for us here. A fantastic. And what you have the results of this? Not only the participation of the students, now we have these nine students that they are experts in astronomy, in the development of apps, and also in the production of animations. And we developed 10 apps and six apps about astronomy. In this address the homepage that you see here, you can see all the apps that was developed. And the, 
one of them I showed you, right? In, in the beginning of 2022, in one of, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. problem here is that it was an app about variable stars. This was the first one that you developed for this project. The other one is about the, the rockets developed by different countries. I have a list of the rockets with all the information of the rockets. This is astronomical keys. Né? That uh, the first one that you developed here. And this one is the challenge that we use in the schools. Now we have the same challenge in you can access in your smartphone. And the last one is about uh, light pollution. <laughs> I offer them in Portuguese, but we are planning now to, to have a version in English of these. Apps. Oh, great. Wonderful. The most oh. important is that now I have a group that knows that they know how to produce the apps. This right. is most fantastic, no? And this is the address for the apps. And also we have six animations no? with this group that starts of tomorrow. No? I show it here in the programs, no? Here you have the links where you can see all the animations. Now uh, we have only Portuguese, but uh, uh, we are planning to make a version in English now of the animations. Yeah. And I hope that uh, in a future, not so so far from now, we produce a new a new city of uh, animations. Then. Tomorrow, you, you close the project with these events, and, but we are already uh, planning to announce in November or December a new project that we are going to develop in our region here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And now I have something that is, is something unexpected for, for me, that International Dark Sky Association they consider me as the monthly stars in August wow. and about what happened here in our region. And uh, I'm very happy with the... the thank you. Thank you. That's great. And, and they, <laughs> they, gave, they gave me a, an award. No? Wow. And they, they, uh, the first time a Brazilian received an award. Yeah. From oh, that's the great. The National Dark Sky Association is the Dark Sky Defender Awards. That is fantastic. Congratulations, Marcello. Very well thank deserved. You. Thank you very much. I'm very happy. I would like to thank the International Dark Sky Association and thank you everybody. And I also thank you because the participation also in the Sky App magazine. Uh, we had the opportunity also to show what happened here, the mm -hmm. announcement, to have an article in awesome. the, about the Dark Sky Park here in our region. Then it's important to, to have the opportunity to share our experience here. Thank you very much, Scott, for all your support. And the, it's a great pleasure thank you. to be here. Thank you. I am so happy for you. So that's great. And I know many more good things are to come. So. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, they, they should build a, uh, a, you know, a shrine to, uh, to you and to all your work that you've done there in Brazil and the entire region of South America. I know you're well known. And um, um, so thank you for all the great work you've done in bringing uh, space exploration, astronomy, now dark skies being protected and generations of young people who are going on to make a difference in in the world and in their own lives so that's just fantastic thank you very much it's a thank great you. pleasure to be here thank you thank you okay all right so uh we are still going to stay in south america we're going all the way down to uh buenos aires argentina where caesar bro just gave some talks to an amazing astronomy event down there. Um, so let's uh, let's bring Caesar on and uh, 
Caesar, you got the stage, man. Someplace you're very comfortable with because you, you know, you, <laughs> yes, there's yes. guys here. There's guys here in chat that are talking about your amazing uh, presentation <laughs> and how you were the best one. I have no doubt about that. But uh, no, no, no. I, I can't. Yeah, all your the, fans the are here. In, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I watch the, the comments in, in YouTube. Are, my God. Oh, yes. It's the grow. Yeah. It's the essence of the grow. It, yeah. The essence of uh, of this totally funny group of people that was totally uh the happiness the the motion uh, of the the catamarca um uh, before sorry uh, um catamarca catamarca star party we went to here in buenos aires uh we was uh, we was a sponsor of uh the um, Reunion Anual uh, of the Association Astronomy Argentina Astronomy Association that is that the this, this association enjoy, um, is for the professional uh, astronomers for and for um, of course uh, investigators students astronomy professional students uh, um, we start. Um, working in Buenos Aires, um, we, we, um, uh, 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 we put in a screen, the, in, in a live, in, inside the, the, astro the astronomy meeting in the, in the hour stand, uh, we put uh, to you and your uh, uh, equipment uh, from the Arizona Star Party. Uh, we show to the people, uh, we talk about your Star Party in Arizona, in Buenos Aires. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was very, very interesting. Um, we enjoyed to, to um, I'll show you first a, a, a little part uh, before Catamarca Star Party of... Uh, Please the, do, the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah the, tell, us, the, tell us about this uh, Star Party and uh, the Catamarca uh, group. Yes, yes, absolutely. You can you can see the, the screen. Yes. Okay. Well, here uh, we, we started in in uh, this is the stand when we had the stand ready to uh, in in the hall of the the Buenos Aires University. This area is, is a new new one is for math and physics students. It's very very here something that I I need to explain from Argentina. This is a public free education. This is very important to to show that this is a not a paid university is free it is it's incredible in our country something that we have is very important for us all that i show you the the of the building is is, is a free university That's here great. uh here uh well this is this was the 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 all about about the the conference students and astronomers watching you can see here in the screen your star party <laughs> and, oh, in Arizona. <laughs> yes, yes. It's amazing. Oh, that's great. Let me share. Yes, without without sound because we don't uh, we um yeah. we don't yes, yes I, I know the, the things about oh, great. music and YouTube or or in yeah. presentations. Yes. But here is is the stand, the people. You know this this kind of telescope, maybe. Uh, uh, I've heard of them. Yes, yes. I've yes heard of maybe them. you know. Yeah, <laughs> we we work a lot. Well, it's a very nice display. People. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was a pleasure for us, and uh, really, you uh, uh, when a, a sponsor uh, it, it throw us, and uh, and this was a a, a beautiful. Uh, coffee breaks in, in Buenos mm -hmm. Aires in the, the zero the zero uh, building here friends mm -hmm. another another video look the the, the building this That's is free very nice. university this is huge a, yeah yes it's amazing <laughs> it's incredible yes I, I, I took the, this video only to show for the people that that this university is, is amazing. It's all for 
uh, math and physics department. Wow. This university is very, very huge and yeah. uh, architectural or, you know, uh, uh, social science. Yeah. Or, you know. Super modern. It's, it's nice. All, absolutely. And this is all the posters of, of uh, the expositors, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 for investigations, you know. And really, we enjoy it a lot. And we talk with the students of astronomy, professional astronomy, a lot about um, optics, sensors, photography, astrophotography. And was very interesting, the, 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 the things between the professional uh, uh, astronomy students and the world, our world of uh, amateur telescopes. And something that every time is more near uh, uh, between professional and amateurs is the techniques, uh, especially for astrophotography. And this one was, um, I, I saw that the people was very, very happy and they take a, a, a great, oh, yeah. Yeah. A, a great like time, especially students. They love it to, to, to talk about about the things that we use as uh, amateur astronomers. It's, it's, it's funny that they say, okay, I can explain something from our world. Right. And, and this was the, the solar uh, the solar image for, for the students was very, very... This this building that you, you can see in, in red bricks, it's the IAFE, it's, it's a place uh, where they, this is like a, for, Cosmology. They use their. It's a place where investigate. Um, they investigate all about space and astronomy. Yafe, for it's a, it's a a place for for of course for for investigation. Mm -hmm. Well, here you can you you know maybe the telescopes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I say I know course, most of the telescopes, but yes, I yeah, definitely recognize our own. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I I, I can say say okay, y después, and uh, yes, and, and and after we we went to Catamarca. Catamarca okay. is Catamarca is amazing, amazing province of Argentina, full of mountain, full. Oh, they. Yeah. They don't know really the, the, the all the the completely the names of the their mountains because they have a lot a lot of mountains in, in oh. Catamarca. I was uh, totally amazed for for the 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 landscape of Catamarca. Catamarca have a, especially a song about their own landscape in, in the folklore Argentinian folklore that that the name is landscape or paisajes de Catamarca, landscape of Catamarca. And uh, uh, that, of course, that when we when we, we was going in the road, we used handies to communicate between us. And we was talking, we was, sorry, we was singing paisajes de Catamarca, the song <laughs> between us by handy in communication it was really we, we, was a really a fun uh, song between us in the cars. We went, uh, uh, for example, this is the typical, the typical astro amateur astronomer going to to a place to a sub party full of telescope and equipment. Look that. Well, here was the first day, the first day, mm. and um, where. Uh, this was um, um, organized by the Ministerio de Ciencia and Innovation Technological, the University of Catamarca, the Instituto Superior Enrique Guillermo Hood, and the local, my, my friends of uh, Estrella Verde, the green star of my, that were my, the, the creator of the green star is uh, my friend, uh, Miguel Magakian. This is this was a, an originally a private, a private, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a private idea of of um, to make their own observatory, but giving the observatory to the community for education of of my friend Miguel Magakian. And this is mm. amazing. And he received, or, or the Grove, Estrella, Estrella Verde, the Green Star, received 
uh, the the support of the local governments. The and this was excellent. You maybe can see the 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 Ministry of Science and Innovation Technological, the government of Catamarca. In, sorry, in English, I, I don't know how to <laughs> translate the very large. It's okay. It's yes, okay. but it's, it's a, you understand that. Yeah, yeah, and and you have Caesar. You have many people watching. It looks like from Argentina right now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we call it the hinchada. You can yes. talk in Spanish if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see the comments. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. My, my, uh, 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 for example, here, uh, my my friend uh, yeah. uh, Jaime Garcia. Jaime Garcia is my co-keeper, my my partner in another third party in mm -hmm. uh, uh, Valle Grande third party in Mendoza. This is another province, and he was invited. And he was very important uh, math and specialist in, in astronomy. He was president of the ABSO in the past. Um, this was in the first day where uh, spoke uh, Jaime Garcia, Nicolás Balbi, uh, mm. uh, Diego Jaime, that is uh, the director of the, observa the new observatory, the obs Magakian Observatory, because my the name of my friend Miguel, Miguel Magakian, and this is, uh, you know, Magakian, where is the, the last name? From Armenia, from Armenia. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Yes, Argentina is full of Armenian people, and, oh. and it's a huge community, really, uh -huh. really, especially in the province, in the northwest, it's full, and it's a huge community. And he had the, the great idea to, to call to his observatory, Magaki, uh, Observatorio Magakian, or something like, uh, you know, playing with the last name, Magakian Observatory, it mm. was a great idea, Re really, really a, a nice idea. Well, this was in the in the second day where uh, another friend that maybe you know because you call with me and um, at, uh, and uh, Gabriel Bengochea that he's a cosmologist, yeah. a physics. Do you remember the name that you talked with me and Gabriel in the road when we uh, we was returning from? from the the uh, from the patagonia uh, we talk between uh, in the road in the, in the gas station <laughs> uh, gabriel gabriel uh, really enjoy us with a lot of of things about about physics about uh, uh quantum physics or and all about gravitation especially he he it actually is is is, uh, is uh, in the investigation and sir um, of uh, all about uh, gravitational force you know dark energies all that this is a is a, a, a great specialist in this mm. well more of of uh, uh, Jaime Garcia Maybe you know this guy. I, I talk only a little of, about optics and, uh, and, and uh, well, you know, but you know me, no problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Something that I receive. Uh, they were so great with me. I, I was really, uh, uh, I, I was really uh, amazed with the work that all these people work about, about the, the um, you know, the, the things uh, that the work that they made for this for this um, store party um you know the the meet the first the, the name of the this was first jornada nacional de astronomía in catamarca mm. well and of course that i went so fast as was uh, fast as possible i went to the to prepare the observatory with with uh, Diego Diego uh, Jaimes that Diego uh, it's, it's an excellent professor uh, for mm -hmm. kids and teenagers and he's the director for for the of the observatory and we work fastly for the night to put Jupiter in a camera you know for mm -hmm. the first light of the of the observatory mm -hmm. And uh, and this is the the tower. Here you, you 
here is the is the dome, but it's impossible to see now from here. But it's is in here the, the dome. Here's uh, the go the uh, the government the government uh, give to to the observatory the two big screens to show uh, you know presentation and the, the oh, that's great Look at that. yeah yes. yeah the screen yeah, was yeah. touch <laughs> with touch and they was like a, each one was a was a computer for me it was wow a rico brand i don't know it was amazing okay the the and the party started and was amazing with talking about the history and miguel miguel when i went i went uh, to the airport miguel came to to the airport to re to receive me in the in and going to the city catamarca city san fernando del valle catamarca city and we went uh, he told me cesar i have a surprise for you and you know when i, I think okay i don't know I am scary sometimes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but yes, yes. Miguel have a, a huge, a huge energy. It's yeah. a guy that you know when when if you can if you sometimes you came here and uh, we can go to. Okay, you know, this guy. that's a yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And uh, we started the, the, uh, talking about the history of of the the how was all about the the Estrella Verde. The, the, the grow green star started and um, was a very very nice very emotional the 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 world that the, we, that they made to have a, a, an association a grow an observatory you know it's a private observatory and it's amazing it's open to the old community of of uh, mm. of uh, San Fernando del Valle de Catamarca well here the presentation the, the a lot of people and the inauguration and uh, something that that for me was amazing here is the inauguration here i am <laughs> mm -hmm. and something was amazing for me was that that they uh, uncovered uh, uh, miguel uncovered wow the, something that. that were yes yeah i am part yeah. of the grand uh, <laughs> both parents Congratulations and for Peter. me. Yes, I can. I can't believe this. For me, yeah, it's a, it's that's a, wonderful. It's a huge, a huge. You know, it's a big uh, honor. Yes, big honor. Absolutely. For me, it was yeah. Wow, yeah. totally amazing. But by, by like this, by this. Well, here yeah. you have. Where is the the the? Yes, yes. It's, I am more responsible now about this. <laughs> but, but yes, absolutely. Well, here you're not going to forget us now, Caesar. Now that you're really famous and uh, yes. right? Are you, yeah, yeah, yes. remember? Anyway, I say, who is Caesar? Brown? <laughs> yeah. yes. Why? Yes, but if you, for example, congratulations. Yeah, for me, but for example, Victor Busso, well, Jaime Garcia was uh, horrible from uh, for him because it's mm. Jaime. It's uh, and Victor Busso is a discover of the supernova, Argentina supernova. Um, it's a wow. huge honor for me. It, uh, uh, sure. yes, it's my name in the same place. Of course, that was. I am really, really grateful with this. Well, here do you have the Jupiter in 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 the screen. The people say, "Oh, wow!" And this is not the, the kids. You know, the people yeah. say something that we work for this to say the first line in the in the new technology. Uh, with a, a beautiful Jupiter to mm -hmm. show to the to the people. Mm -hmm. Here is Victor Busso, that is a is a genius, a, a very very affordable man. You know, it's it's uh, unfortunately they don't speak English, but come on, it's so yeah. so. Um, it's I, okay. I, it's yes, okay. I need an, some idea to present in, in some uh, global star party uh, sure. to him. And uh, maybe I can translate something. I I, I don't yes, know. Yes, of course. My, my idea is is to make something with him because he's the the only uh, amateur astronomer that he know a lot about about uh, supernovas, and it's something where um, uh, it's special that he discovered the supernova when the supernova started. 
started to to level up uh, the bride to explode. Um, this is something that you can search Victor Busso in, in Google to or Argentina Supernova three, four years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, when he explained to the people how the, you know, know the technical things, in, if not the 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 the, the humanist the, the human part of the motion or you know it was amazing. So the next day we traveled 600 kilometers and went up to three three thousand four hundred meters above sea level. Oh this is real. Yeah. <laughs> yes, fine. because we went to the real <laughs> to the real place of the star party. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe maybe I can read it in the comments uh, <laughs> how the people feel about you know yeah. you need oxygen you need oxygen yes there. yes yeah. something that i can can explain that that i receive it, like uh, support in this part it's illegal that you can you can put a coca uh, how to say the name of of the parts of the plant well i don't know but no cocaine coca the the, the part of the plant yeah and uh and you need really that and for me say okay okay yeah need... to help against uh, the, yeah. yes this is oh, of course yes i need to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. taste that or to try yes of course it was well known. totally helping for me and it's real the the things yeah. uh, because if not it's, it's a terrible uh, situation with the, with a high altitude well How here the sky? we started How the sky like at, uh, the, the sky must have been amazing there no no no, no really we we don't have more than maybe two pictures that i can show you about okay. through the telescope because we were totally amazing amazing about the the sky and for example for me i never put the camera in my telescope because was for example i never seen i never saw sorry the um, the in in so bright uh, to the naked eyes remember that we are in the argentina yeah for example the uh, m31 the andromeda galaxy oh yeah come on what's easy it? easy to see naked eye yeah absolutely and we enjoy more a lot of people that carry their cameras they don't use because we was watching about the telescope the helix nebula totally completely for or the flame nebula flame nebulas is something that is you know uh, is near to the bright uh the bright alnitak maybe uh, star um and i think that without filter in at in i saw the horse head nebula too a little, wow so little. without a filter a little, but yes That's I saw dark. It. yes yes that is dark Yes, I don't have in this moment, you know, the, the oxygen tree uh, filter. Um, really, really, we we uh, enjoyed a lot uh, to see the sky. We had a, a 16 uh, inches uh, telescope. We have 11 inches telescopes. We have a lot of telescope uh, with uh, great apertures where we use it and we um, we really enjoyed the the to observing situation of, of the sky where they say come on it's for me i never i don't remember to see a so beautiful dark sky in many many years it was amazing yeah yeah it would be hard to beat yeah yes absolutely as she said liliana liliana sakalian is the miguel macaquian wife and if you have, if you have, a, 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 we we call it that. Uh, beside a, a great man, you have a great great woman. She's a genius. She work a lot, will kill a lot, in the organization of the Star mm -hmm. Party. Um, um, and really, I'm uh, helpful with. Um, uh, uh, I'm really, um, how do you say, uh, happy that uh, Liliana. Uh, work and organize a lot of things about the the this star party. 
here do you have one of of the of the meat inside in the the hotel not in catamarca if not in the in cortaderas uh, cortaderas uh, hotel uh, here we had uh, uh, we had about um, three uh, well the, the place with three thousand four hundred meters uh, uh, over the sea and really we enjoyed a lot of meats and uh, you know uh, things where the people like Victor Wusso explained things about about his new book about how mm -hmm. he discovered the the supernova Argentina. Uh, Sebastián Otero from the Abso. Sebastián is from Argentina, but he worked in the Abso. Maybe people from the Abso know him, of course. And we enjoy it. We prepare this uh, living room for for you know. Uh, to to enjoy and share uh, meets and presentations, uh, we had a, a great presentation from from Sebastian, um, Santiago Mayese, uh, Nicolas Valvi, uh, Fernando Ricardini, and me. We explain things about the San Miguel, you know, Restoration Observatory. Mm -hmm. This guy is the governor. The governor of Catamarca, he visited us in the night, <laughs> and we were saying, "Oh my God, really?" They they, uh, they feel it that was really important for for them, and of course for for us, and uh, it was a, a, a smart uh, person that were that enjoyed and um, talked with us. Very affordable person. Was, was really a great experience. Well, here is something of the, of the landscape of the place for to start in because it's over, it's very near to the real Andes, and it's it's a, near to the frontier with Chile. Uh, the place is amazing, totally amazing. Well, here starting to the night. Here. Uh, um, one of my customers and friend, Alejandro Varelli, uh, and is it the typical things that we make at uh, afternoon? You know, uh, put the telescope in, the, in, the, in place and prepare everything. And here you have something of the night with lasers pointing to the stars, enjoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a picture with my my cell phone. Because I was totally, totally amazing and losing my, my idea to take good pictures. But you know, here we have, for example, here, well, the the EXOS 100 with the uh, the Newtonian 130. Uh, here the Dobsonian 16 inches. Uh, but really, we enjoy it a lot, a lot, really, to to put our eyes in the in the in the in the eyepiece, really, really. For ah, here, Alejandro Varelli, he have a collection of 80, 80 eyepieces. And many of them are explorer scientifics. <laughs> People with a star, something that we love, really, really. Here uh, is uh, a Jaime, uh, sorry. Um, here is, is Diego Jaimes. Um, people from uh, that from the Catamarca government that are fr now are friends and they support a lot over the all things about that we need for the organization that they need for organization. Well, here is the people with the telescope in the in the wow uh, look the at this place, place of the hotel. Yes, yes, yeah. it's amazing. Yes, nor is something that if if you have a a hotel with a lot of commodities, with a lot of of, yeah. uh, of amenities. Sorry, yeah. uh, where do you have only to walk uh, four meters and put your telescopes? Uh, we enjoy it a lot, really, really. Um, we are happy to lose a lot of photographies because we talk about the say, okay, but we we enjoy the sky to the naked eye or to the telescope. Yeah. Uh, we don't need I mean, look how dark it is so that you can see stars 
I yeah, mean, it's not like there's a light dome or anything. It's it's yeah. just yes. dark. It's I, great. I think I think that it's impossible to to show how was this uh, style. Yeah. The pictures are not so good, like uh, you know, to show the real thing are. But for me, it was totally amazing. And all people send me the pictures uh, of this same group, and the pictures are amazing. And with cell phones, <laughs> they are yeah. not. Large they are not a reflex camera. Cost. No, yeah. no, no. I said, yeah. okay, guys, send me pictures, and the pictures yeah. are, are amazing, amazing. Yeah, this, the, beautiful. The big one and the small one, Magellanic clouds. You know, yes. Like the same idea when you watch this. Uh, we watch it to the sky like pictures. In mm. another side, Andromeda, like a picture. You can see in the sky. And come on, we are at, at in this moment, we were at uh, 27, 27 degrees, latitude degrees uh, south. Um, we had Andromeda galaxy to, to watch by the telescope or, uh, you know, was totally amazing. But the, this one, these clouds was totally insane insane all night i say okay my god it's incredible and a, another picture of the, the the milky way the milky way uh, was uh, uh, of course that uh, we was we watch uh, we watched mostly the the orion arm not the milky way of in of the uh, of this side i uh, hear well uh, is Pablo Fisele or another customer and friend, something that they say, sometimes my customers are friends too. Yes. Fernando Ricardini was the only, the, one of the, I have another picture that I don't have now that the, the four galaxies in, in grass, grows, um, but a picture that, that I can show you is from Fernando Ricardini um, of uh, Tarantula Nebula, a southern nebula that this nebula i can tell you that this nebula we can solve this nebula a little a little uh, loss brighter brighter and mm -hmm. black and white image um mm -hmm. the, the the i can i can tell you the the you know the how we feel to the eyes in the in uh, especially from the dobson 16 inches dobson yes. um, was amazing. The picture is amazing, but the things that the real life details, the real life details of this same nebula was totally, yeah. totally insane. Yeah. And here we enjoyed a lot the landscape. We went to the to to pictures of of birds. Um, you know, the place is amazing. Was out uh, for me was totally I, I never I never uh uh, went to the this part of the country and it's incredible, incredible for me. Look that it's totally insane. It's the high altitude. We we went a place where we uh, uh, we are here. Here wow. we went five thousand meters over the, the the sea level. Wow! It's look incredible. how blue. Look yes. how blue the water is. Look how blue. Yes, it's totally insane. This here, do you have a, a, a volcano? Well, it's all thing about this is another. This is a, a, a volcano with a glacier. No, no, no. It's totally. <laughs> it's incredible, the place. Uh, here, while well, uh, watching birds, um, bicunias, um, uh, you know, it's amazing. Um, Sebastián Otero from the Abso is a specialist in, to, in about birds, birds we were watching, and he took a, amazing pictures of birds. Um, maybe he needs to talk and make a presentation with Kent, with Kent Smart about bird watching. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And look at this picture. Yes, we have this. Was this was was a, 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 a amazing experience, astronomical, and you know uh, about the nature, about the landscape, the universe. You know, here Sebastián Otero and he's Miguel 
uh, Miguel Magakian, and really, uh, I, I am really uh, happy to know this this guy because he's a very human person. Uh, uh, he uh, and uh, uh, and his uh, wife are amazing, and his family is is a, a, a beautiful beautiful people. We're here, our guest <laughs> uh, in the in the translations. No translation, it's not, uh, yes, go, sorry. you know, going in, sorry, so no translation, go, go into the part to visit, you know, the dinner, the price, you know, and we enjoy it a lot, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. of course, the food in our star party is a very important part, sure. <laughs> Remember, Scott. Yes. For anyone that came to Argentina, food are are totally the, uh, well in the United States. I, I enjoy it a lot in the Star Party, in in Atlanta Star Party about food. Yeah, yeah. Sure. We have something yeah, absolutely. Astronomers got to eat, right? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. <laughs> what, really, we have a, a happy a happy experience, and mm. really we are uh, preparing the next year in October the uh, the the same the same. Uh, uh, store party uh, with new things about about uh, the organization. We we will have having the the in April Valle Grande Star Party and mm -hmm. maybe around October the second edition of of this star party. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you, to, Thank you the, so much. The people that made this and really I enjoy it so much this star party and of course that you are all invited um any uh, thing that you know to, for to take the try the trip the you know all information i can give you all about this uh, maybe okay. we can put this in 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 uh, i don't I'm know happy to help you advertise the event Cesar. yes yes of course yeah. Course. Yeah, maybe in the fantastic. comments, if if uh, Liliana or uh, Diego uh, Jaime put something about how to contact them for the next year, is perfect. You can watch in the in the comments. Wonderful. Of beauty of uh, YouTube, of course. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, and thanks to all of your the Argentina audience there. That uh, I think many of these people were at your event, so. Um, yeah. Yes, I can see. I can see that. That. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the comments now. Yes. Yes. That's good. Yes. It, That's good. It, the grow is so. It's it's a it's a so it's a kindness. It's a, it's a so happy. We we had a great great moment. This is, was really really uh, was a great experience. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Thank you, Cesar. By the opportunity to show this, um, of course that you know I can we can see you uh, next time in this is a very yes. yes yes okay all right take care Cesar thank you uh, thank you thank you very much all right okay so uh, up next we have John Johnson who uh, uh, leads the Nebraska Star Party and uh, so he's going to give us. Um, uh, some um, report on, uh, on what's going on uh, for the next year. Uh, you know, uh, Nebraska Star Party has been celebrating its dark skies uh, for three decades. And uh, so, um, and along with that comes some exciting news. So I'm gonna turn this over to John. Thank you for, for coming on so late, John. Hello. Can you I know me? it's not late for you because you're no. an astronomer. But... Hey. <laughs> okay, I've been sitting up. I haven't been talking, so I need to warm up my voice here. Warm it up. That's right. Okay, so can you, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. You, okay, I got my yeah. little mic there. Okay, um, well, I'll jump right into it. I, I uh, it, it, Caesar's a hard act to follow, as they say. My goodness, I, <laughs> I, I was going to brag about my star party, but uh, man, I, I, I won't be able to. Well, you have you have uh, justifiably a lot. We to have the dark skies. About. You and do. I I have a few pictures. I'm going to try to pull up a a PowerPoint here. Uh, okay. Uh, 
And so we'll see what happens. Uh, okay. Help me along here. Let's see. I'll hit the share screen. Okay, hit that one. Yeah, it looks like it's... How are we doing? Okay, so if, if I there go ahead... Go, and, and you just need to bring it into presentation. There mode. we go. There you are. Great. Here, here we are. Okay. I like that. CIV. That's, that's a... CIV, like 104th. Yeah. It, it took me a, a few seconds when you first sent those to figure it out. But, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through a, a brief. I don't know how many people you have watching. Uh, but I'll try to go through this real quick, just what the Nebraska Star Party is and sure. a little bit why are we. So I'll, I'll, I'll run it fast. If anybody has a question, they can stop me. So uh, we're a, a, a fully uh, registered nonprofit organization in the state of Nebraska and in the U.S. Uh, chartered to promote, encourage both uh, public and private uh, uh, astronomical observing activities. Encourage dark sky friendly outdoor lighting practices in the state of Nebraska. More on that later. Uh, we sponsor an annual star party at what's called Merritt Reservoir, which is about 35 miles southwest of a small town in, uh, in the north central part of Nebraska. Uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, next year, 2023, will be our 30th year of holding the star party there. Uh, you may think us sodbusters are uh, out there in sod houses and, and old time clothes, but uh, that's just just to give you that impression that we're, we're out here in the prairie. Uh, it's a gathering from all walks of life uh, that share a common interest in seeing the nice guy as the Native Americans, the early pioneers, settlers saw it out here in Nebraska. The Sandals area around Merritt Reservoir provides a location yet today that is a premier dark sky site, as I've mentioned many times before on here. They're located, here's the state of Nebraska. You see this uh, little town of Valentine up there of about 3,500 people. But you can already see with this map, there are not many towns in that area. And that's why it is such a great place to go. We hold this event right by this little lake here called Merritt Reservoir, right by a, uh, a national forest, which has more uh, grass than trees. but it's still called a national forest. So why there? Uh, have you seen the, uh, one of these weather satellite images of the Earth taken at night? Everyone goes, ooh, isn't that pretty? Just look at all those tiny points of light shining out in space. Beautiful, right? Well, it is. But let's look at what all that light is really doing to our ability to see out into space from the ground level. There's an image uh, showing the, the, the various light pollution areas around the whole continental United States. And you can easily pick out some of the major metropolitan areas. There's Chicago, there's Minneapolis, of course, Washington DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, out here in California, the LA basin, there's Denver, of course, Dallas. But look up here, there's mm -hmm. a little dark spot in Nebraska. As we zoom in, you can see where that dark spot is. This is Denver. This is Omaha, Nebraska. This one over here is Kansas City. Zooming in a little further, X marks the spot where we hold the, uh, the Nebraska Star Party. It's right on the edge, but we indeed are in uh, a Bortle One sky there. Activities other than stargazing that you can take part in. Uh, there's the lake offers boating, fishing, hiking, swimming. It's a beautiful lake to have summertime recreation on. Uh, there's cooing and canoeing and tubing down the Niobrara River, which is always a fun activity. Uh, there's the Vas Valentine National Wildlife Refuge, which has a lot of native animals to the area, including quite a herd of bison, which are always fun to, to look at and stay not too close to. And it's close enough to the, for day trips to the Black Hills and the Badland National Park. We emphasize education. Uh, we have an astronomer's beginner's field school, which we hold three days a week, two hour sessions. Uh, and as, as I said, we, we really emphasize and cater to uh, the, the, the people just getting started in astronomy or, or, or just new to the, the hobby. So uh, we really uh, set it up that way. And on Wednesdays, we have a lecture series at the Valentine High School. They have a beautiful facility there. 
and uh, we draw in some really exciting speakers, as I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, we also hold a children's program because, as I said, we emphasize the family. And so uh, during the Wednesday uh, lecture series, we have a, a, an afternoon children's program, which always um, gives a, or we always get a lot of uh, kudos for that. Mm -hmm. and of course, the beauty of the night sky from there is really what we go to and it's really unbelievable. Uh, and the pictures do not do it justice. Uh, but here's a few. Uh, these are from previous years, and then I'll get into some specifics from last year. Typical Milky Way shot uh, from up there. There's a view looking wow. north of the northern Milky Way. And all the... Uh... All the vehicles with the red lights. The sky glow, the, the green sky well, glow. And, and, and it was it was really, really apparent this year. Yeah. And uh, people think, well, what? Of course, to the human eye, it just kind of looks like little gray streaks. Uh, your eyes aren't sensitive to pick up that greenish color, which is what it is. Is of course the uh, the oxygen ap uh, atoms in the atmosphere. Uh, releasing the energy they absorb during the, the sun, you know, the, during the day in the sun. And so they're giving off this little faint green light. Speaking of Andromeda, there's Andromeda. There's a double cluster and, you know, between Perseus and Cassiopeia here. There's another shot of Andromeda. Andromeda is easy naked eye up there all the time. Oh yeah. Above the horizon. Uh, yeah. Very obvious. And, and, a, and a, uh, 50 millimeter binoculars, either seven or 10 power. Uh, you, you can see, you know, the whole, uh, it'll stretch across like a four degree field in your, in your binoculars. I can't remember the orientation on this spot, but this is just a dense area of the Milky Way. It's probably around, I think maybe Vega and, and whatever. Now we do get some natural light pollution up there occasionally. Uh, there was a few years ago we had uh, some yeah, beautiful look at aurora. That. That's beautiful. <laughs> but we, you know, we well, some of the real diehard uh, people, uh, you know, they weren't happy with the the natural light pollution. But the rest of us were oohing and aahing, especially if you had a camera and you could take time exposures of it. We have this area that's kind of unique up there. We call it Dob Row, and you uh, can obviously see why. Uh, it's a nice asphalt area, about the half the size of a football field that stretches down a road. Uh, and uh, so that's where the guys with the big guns set up and uh, getting prepared for a night of observing. Here's some specifics from uh, this year's event, uh, 2022. Uh, it was held from July 4th through the July 29th. And it was our 29th year of holding the star party. Uh, we had a total attendance of 308 people this year, which uh, is a little more than what we've been averaging, but a little bit down from uh, actually last year. We had about 360 total registrants. But uh, mm -hmm. but I, I think with the uh, excitement I'll tell you about here in a little bit, uh, 300 is going to be probably the norm or the minimum we get up from, from now on because uh, it's getting we're getting a lot of a lot of interest. Uh, it's always a mixed bag of clear and cloudy nights. I think uh, I was up there from Sunday through Saturday night. Um, we got a couple nights where you have to deal with the clouds, but boy, that night that comes along when it's clear, it is just unbelievable. And as we've talked before, and it, we were talking with Caesar, the Milky Way will actually cast a shadow up there. I mean, yes, it, it does. You say it's dark, it you know, but that. it. It's not, you know, it's not really that dark. Uh, and that's why we always say you, you got to come out. Uh, if you want to plan for next year's event, come at least for three nights, preferably all week uh, to get in on the, what it's really like up there. As I said, when it's clear, it is an amazing location to both observe and image from. Uh, we had some great speakers this year. Uh, just, it was really exciting. Uh, we had a, a kind of a homegrown fella. Uh, he grew up in Omaha, was a member of our local astronomy club, which we call the Omaha Astronomical Society, uh, attended our meetings regularly. Uh, he went to, he's got his undergraduate right here in Omaha at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. But then um, uh, he's currently teaching at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, uh, physics and astronomy. 
but he went on to get his master's and PhD um, from University of Colorado and his specific research is in exoplanets. So he gave us a very interesting talk on his research on how they've discovered exoplanets and some of the details mm -hmm. about them. And this next person, I'm sure if anybody has watched many of the global star parties, you'll recognize that name. Uh, Libby yeah, in the stars. stars. Libby White yes. was there with her mom. And uh, I think this was her first official, you know, really big star party. And I think you're right. She's she been was, to it for a long time. She was just, you know, totally overwhelmed uh, with, you know, with what we could see up there and everything and gave an absolutely delightful talk on Wednesday. And then we finished up with Dr. Diana Hannah Kanan who is currently the observing editor for Sky and Telescope magazine. If you get her, get the publication, you'll, you'll notice her byline in there quite often. Uh, she's, she puts together the whole observing section, but she will occasionally write an article uh, herself. Uh, but she also, her, uh, or her uh, education through a doctorate, uh, I think from the University of Helsinki, I went on and did research in microquasars, which was very interesting. Uh, microquasar. Had, uh, microquasars. Hmm. <laughs> it was interesting, uh, and a lot of it in uh, radio wavelength uh, uh, astronomy. And she'd worked down in Australia for um, uh, down there with radio telescopes and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But an absolutely delightful person, uh, had never been out to this part of the United States, Nebraska, or the Sandhills, and was just absolutely totally blown away with not only the, uh, the, the eco ecosystems out here, but uh, the people and, and, of course, the star party itself. Um, here's a quick picture. Here's a picture of Adam, not the best. Uh, it's when, when he was talking at the high school on Wednesday. And of course, there's Libby. Um, I, I pulled this this particular slide up. <laughs> My mom yeah. took me to an Explorer Scientific viewing. One of her <laughs> key key points of of getting excited and interested in astronomy. Yeah. And and of course, as she's talked about on the Global Star Party, she's been to space camp several times. And yes. And, and for I I don't think she's even, maybe she has had her birthday, but she was not even 13. She was still 12 at this point in July yeah. for that young person to get up and talk almost extemporaneously to, you know, a full audience of a couple hundred people uh, was, right. was just amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. She is, she is something else. So you, you folks down there keep encouraging her. <laughs> yeah. And of course, Diana, uh, this particular slide was, she was talking about her quasars and then how she transitioned to Sky and Telescope magazine. Uh, she had just kind of got burnt out on, on uh, doing research. And so back in, I think it was 2017 or so, mm -hmm. uh, she answered an ad, an, an ad in somewhere that, you know, Sky and Telescope was looking for a new observing editor and she jumped on it and is really having a great time, enjoys it very much. Wonderful. So. If you get a chance to meet her sometime, uh, everyone, you know, please, please do. Yep. She gave a great presentation, I imagine. She gave a great presentation on both the microquasars and, of course, on what she's doing at Sky and Telescope and what they, you know, what the activities, uh, you know, I'm, I've become, a, of course, I've been a subscriber for more years than I care to admit right at the moment, but uh, uh, I, yeah, I'm a, I guess I'm also an ambassador for Sky and Telescope magazine. I, I think they, they've really kind of turned it around in the last three or four years, you know, they were kind of in trouble financially and everything. <clears throat> and I, uh, I believe they, they got it. Yeah. Really the American great Astronomical magazine. Society, right. the magazine. Yep. So. They're part of AAS now and that's that right. provide some great resources. So that's right. anyway, there's the, the, the three plus Jack Dunn. Uh, some of you may know Jack. Jack uh, was the planetarium director at the university of Nebraska for, oh, I don't know, 30, 33, 34 years retired moved to South Carolina. His wife now uh, runs the, uh, the planetarium uh, there in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, but he still comes out to the star party and he's kind of the guy that helps, you know, put the speaker program together. So. Anyway, and here's the pictures I was promising you. Okay. Wow. I can't, That's these, beautiful. And they're all of course in, in uh, 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 vertical format. Um, yeah. But, and I can't claim credit for any of these. 
these were taken by Matt Bielski uh, from Chicago. Uh, he's become a great friend of mine, uh, has uh, been out to several star parties. Uh, and as far as I know, these were all just, you know, single shot you know, 20 second images with an, a Nikon and a, probably a 14 millimeter wide angle lens. Wow. So, wow. and you know, granted, he's that's not that. light pollution back there. That's lightning. Oh, no, that, that is that we had a storm roll through <laughs> that before awesome? that night. Now that, yeah. okay, here, here's another shot, wide angle shot. Right. So the, it just gives you, I mean, the awesome power in, in, storms Amazing. that moved through yeah. this was probably a hundred miles away by the time this shot was taken wow but it shows you the you know we of course we have tents set up for our dinner meals and, and what have you but yeah out there. what an amazing what an amazing view it is just utterly amazing and of course there again you see this green glow yeah um there from the, the o2 atoms there's a i think it's a cool shot of there again what mm -hmm. we call dobro and you see people with trailers, you can see people with RVs. I mean, this whole area just becomes one big party area. <laughs> sure. Hey, come look and see what I got in mind. And, you know, it, it's, yeah. And, and we, we, we keep it that way. We keep it a very friendly, uh, you know, open atmosphere. Yep. A family oriented and, um, you know, totally open to totally beginners. open to the beginners. Yes. Now, if for those of you, I mean, if you want to come up there and do some serious imaging, We've set up an area over to uh, the kind of the northwest of this particular area where you can go and, and do imaging and whatever or do serious observing and not be bothered. But uh, but this is the area where all the fun's happening. <laughs> yeah. And a couple other shots there, uh, you know, people for their red lights and their telescopes. And uh, there's another shot of the, of the clouds. This is one I kind of like. like yeah, it's I like love a that. Bunch of, Look at bunch that. of smoke coming out of this. Yeah. This, is, this is another uh, fellow that comes over from Chicago. Some of you may have heard of him, Dragon Nicken. Uh, he's belongs to the Chicago Club, and that <laughs> I think that telescope is that is a twenty-five Huge. inch uh, obsession. You know, yeah, true obsession telescope. Yeah, he's way up there on that ladder. Oh, those those type of scopes you can. We had somebody like that at Okie Tech, and so we were looking at Thor's helmet. And the mm -hmm. horse head in his yeah. skull. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, no, 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 nothing about a vertivision. You can see it. Well, in straight the on. <laughs> yeah, we were looking <laughs> at this stuff straight on. One of the, one of the really, one is always blows me away. And then we, we, and it's usually almost right overhead is the cat sign nebula up there in Sigma or in Draco. It, it is just, you can see colors. You can see the blues and green, yellows in, in the cat sign nebula. It's, it's amazing. And of course, there was a, I think, a 24 inch over there in the background. Uh, uh, but yeah, there was a, a couple 22, 2018s, big, the big guns. As I said, we do get clouds, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and they can be very impressive. Uh, that was fortunately had already it was it was already way to the east of us, but uh, they can get some impressive thunderheads, but. Here's Matt's again. This was this was earlier in the evening. They're kind of out of sequence, but this, or as far as time, but this was what it was looking like uh, there that evening, and where you see that shot of it way down to the southeast of us. And, and this is one of the most dramatic ones I've ever seen. I mean, you're oh, wondering, yeah, okay, so so where do we go hide? Well, yeah, you see, <laughs> see the bolt of lightning over there. I mean, yeah. it it can get a little scary up there, but uh, but that stuff all you see the rain over there that was to yeah. the west of us, and then yeah. that all went to the south. It just south blew away. East. It yeah. blew away. So uh, that was one of the better nights. Okay, the great news announced just after the star party. We didn't quite get the word before the star party. We knew it was going to happen, but you know, bureaucracies take time. Uh, working with the International Dark Sky Association and in collaboration with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and the Nebraska Tourism Commission, we have received designation for the Merritt Reservoir SRA as a dark sky park. Congratulations. So it, took, uh, it took a while, but we, yep, it's designated. You can check out the IDA website. You can find it. 
Merritt Reservoir State Recreation Area, Dark Sky Park. And kind of a neat thing, we, we were the 200th Dark Sky Park designated in the world. So, Wow. So Congratulations. We're, uh, we're planning uh, for next year to be a, a big year. Uh, and we haven't quite decided if, if the whole celebration, ribbon cutting, whatever, will be at the Star Party next year or some other event. But we'll keep everybody posted. But as far as planning for next year, uh, it'll be the July 16th through the 21st, 2023. Costs, we're hoping to keep the same. Uh, but, you know, ours are very nominal. Uh, of course, we, par we yes. charge extra for meals. We'll have to get with the caterer and find out. But it's all, you know, very nice. And we'll have our field school. Always great food, knowledgeable, friendly astronomers willing to share their knowledge. And we'll have another lecture series. We're trying to line up, you know, speakers already for next year. And we always come up with a great T-shirt design. We're, we're in the process of, of having that all done. Uh, web link, there's the Nebraska Star Party .org web link. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, also on Facebook. And we will probably have early registrations opening with online registration by February 1st. We will send out, what we do is we, we print up a paper brochure and we send it to Everyone that has attended uh, one of the star parties, I think the last three years we go back. So we call out who's been there and they get a personal invite in the mail. Um, you can raise it online or you can send it in from any address. Send in your form. Okay, that's my spiel. Great. Wonderful. Any... <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, uh, when will registration start for next? I think uh, around the first of February. Then we'll we'll, we'll try to get okay. the online opening. Uh, we'll we'll be mailing out brochures. Um, oh, that same you know maybe by the end of January we'll, we'll get brochures mailed out. Yeah. All right. So, Wonderful. Always Wonderful. a great time. So yes. Look forward to maybe we'll see some of you up there this year. All right. Well, thanks again, John, for coming on. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate everything you guys to having do you down there. Uh, uh, come back to uh, Global Star Party again. So yeah, I'll try to uh, you know drop in at some more just to listen in and, and, and sure look. Sure. But um, but uh, always very enjoyable. Uh, All it's, right. It's well, just well, amazing. maybe we can uh, talk you into putting together an article about Nebraska Star Party the 30th anniversary and your dark sky. Um, designation for Merritt Reservoir uh, for Skies Up Magazine it would be very oh, good. That, that that. Okay. Yep. Very good. I'll see awesome. if I can start work up for it. Great. All right. Thanks for All right. Thank I you. know I talk about going every year, but hey, Adrian. Adrian, that, you got to uh, go, uh, man. Yeah. Put that That's not that far away for you. I mean, if you went to Okie, yeah, you can go to this. I can drive, and yeah, I made the drive to. Um, well, basically, two Okie Techs. Yeah. We went to pick up somebody at Denver. So I figure I've been through Kearney yep, on 80 Kearney. trying yep. to mm -hmm. get there, and it would just be another turn. Um, so I'm turn right at Kearney or turn right at North Platte, and about three yeah. hours up the road, and you're there. Yep. So that's, uh, I put it on that weekend at least. If I can't make the whole week, that's why I wanted to get the dates out there just yeah yeah that, that's it you know people you know actually uh, there's people showing up the friday before or even the thursday and will stay through the following weekend just whatever their uh, their personal schedules require but um yeah right so and, yeah know, that's uh no it's interesting i you know i would definitely love to come if i can if i can pull off a uh weekend and yeah. then just head back um or work from there for a day and head back <laughs> there you well, go we, we have people go. yeah especially well I, I, the internet out there or the is a little sketchy but uh if you stay in town yeah there's you set in your hotel and uh do your work and then yeah, come that's, out night. <laughs> that's something i'll have to i'll have to look at have to think through, about. but uh yeah i'm definitely you know you see the thunderhead behind me you yeah have way more impressive thunderheads Along oh, with we, your, we do get uh, some dark skies amazing. out there, so definitely uh, something I have to look at, seeing if I can pull off. It's uh, 
I don't think it would be too bad a trip at this point because I've kind of know I kind of know what that trip is like now. I had to take it. Yeah. Um, I had to I had to do most of the driving myself on the way back. Um, a friend of mine. I'll share some of the story. I won't share the names, but um, we left Oki Tex, um, and unfortunately, my friend had come down with a mild case of COVID, and hmm. we chose not to stay together he flew back that day and i said i'll just drive back no problem and <laughs> so, yeah. i made the two-day trip uh which Kearney, nebraska is one of my stops it's a it's a nice town great mexican restaurant next to the hotel i usually go to so i would simply instead of driving all the way through nebraska i would simply make that right turn yeah drive another three hours from Kearney, and if if I don't just drive from Iowa the first night, drive right on into town and set up shop sure. and see what I can see. So, well, you know how to get a hold of me. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's definitely well, something to look forward to, and all uh, right, see if I can <laughs> see if I can get make it out there. Make it all out right. there. It, it sounds it sounds excellent. So, and congratulations again on getting that. Uh, oh yes, thank eye. you. I, I, that, that's that's big that's huge we've been working for well a long time but the last three years i mean it, it got really <laughs> really serious we're going to get this done you know higher height you know and, and it, mm -hmm. it happens and uh i think we're going to reap a lot of benefits from that excellent great well, yeah, okay yeah. all righty very good all righty john much. thank you very much and we will hopefully see you uh, in a week or two um and uh, so uh, at this point, what we're going to do is uh, we've had uh, uh, Maxi had to drop out because of a storm coming through his area in Argentina. So they were losing electricity. Um, Nico, uh, who was also supposed to be on, uh, had extended band rehearsals. So um, so uh, but I do have a treat for you. Uh, this is um, uh, a video from uh, Doug Struble and Chuck Ayub. They are two astrophotographers that live actually pretty close to each other in Michigan. Uh, and, I know uh, who they all are. They're, yeah, in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. and so, They're in the Plymouth Astrophotography Club. Yeah. Struble yeah. has a unit of time named after him. 30 hours of uh, integration is a Struble. <laughs> is a so, screwball okay so it's uh these are some pretty serious yeah these are serious astrophotographers because yeah. of the michigan skies they have to image all of that time that jason guinzel is right along with them yeah he's right he along with off. those guys he saw that's his right. work that's that's the type of work they put out all the time they spend lots of hours and um they put together these uh amazing shots from bortal seven bortal eight yeah, I think Doug Struble lives in like Bortle Five, but still, it's 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 pretty tough they where do. they are. It is. And it's, um, so this is this is a video about how they do that astrophotography from their own backyards, and how they fight light pollution and get amazing results. So here we go. Hi, I'm Doug Struble, and this is my backyard observatory. Every clear night I possibly get, I open up to take pictures of deep space. Hey, I'm Chuck Ayub, and I live right up the road from Doug. I don't have a home observatory, but like Doug, I usually run two scopes every night. 
Back in spring of 2016, Chuck and I got into this hobby, and back then we had a much simpler setup, trying to just get started out in this hobby, and, and uh, over time we've gotten more sophisticated and automated some of our equipment to make our lives easier and to make our images that much better. That's right, and this hobby is really not difficult to get into. A lot of people make the jump with the equipment they already own, like a DSLR camera and a tripod. We actually fast-tracked some of our equipment upgrades and automation a lot earlier on than we had anticipated due to our skies, but we weren't quite sure what we were gonna get. Right, we're both around 20 minutes from downtown Detroit, where the big city lights known in the astro community as light pollution can wreak havoc on deep space photos. I was even warned by the seller who sold me my camera that he wasn't sure if I'd be able to accomplish anything in my area. This is my main rig right here. It's a Mach 1 GTO made by Astrophysics. Um, I had this pier custom made by a friend of mine who does metalworking. And on top of it sits an Explorer Scientific 165 millimeter um, triplet refractor. Um, it's probably the best telescope I have in terms of getting what I get because I go after a lot of tiny objects. So I need that focal length to really get in there. Uh, on top of that rests my Orion uh, guide scope. And then my second rig is an Atlas Pro made by Orion with a stellar view 102 millimeter on it. Um, this is a little bit wider, but on both systems I am running a ASI 183mm camera, which has very small pixels, so I can get in there really tight and get a good pixel scale of, of both of my objects. Typically, both rigs run on each two laptops, and both of these laptops are run from inside the house. Everything's automated once it gets set up, aside from pickups here and there, of course. And then um, one thing I, I really do to fight light pollution is I do a lot of what's called narrow band. Um, narrow band is exactly what it sounds like. It's a narrow sliver of the visual spectrum. So it cuts out a lot of this light pollution that we have near the city of Detroit. And it allows me to wash away a lot of that light pollution so I can really focus on the nebulosity that exists in the image. Right, narrowband filters are a must, and when I'm not using them, my pictures can become overexposed very quickly. So I've become rather famous online for my short exposure approach. I take 15 second exposures and stack them all together, and you'd be surprised at what you can capture and get around light pollution. Hey Doug, I get this question all the time, and I'm sure you do too. How do you stay on target with your deep space object if the Earth is rotating? That's a good question. So in astrophotography, we use what's called a German equatorial mount. And once we get a polar line to Polaris, the North Star here in the Northern Hemisphere, what it does is it allows the what's called the right ascension to track throughout the night. So it kind of just rotates around that North Star. And to keep it on target, you use a guide scope, which locks onto just any random star, and it will correct, send corrections to the computer, which in turn sends corrections to the mount to keep it on target throughout the whole night. Right, along with the motorized mount and guide scope and guide cameras, we use software to help us automatically find and center on our targets. Even our focus is automated so we can be doing other things while we're imaging. Being fully automated is great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't get involved. In fact, being automated and having more complex gear means there's a lot more things to go wrong. Right, we do get the occasional head scratching and hair pulling issues when we're trying to resolve an issue before the clear night disappears. So Doug, do you have a preference with larger or smaller telescopes? That's an interesting point. I mean, obviously smaller telescopes are a lot less expensive and they do great. And most of them have like a, a very short focal length, which means they get a wide field of view. And most of my, my objects back then I first started out with were a wide field of view. But what my one friend Jim Bernard once said, most things in the universe are small. So over the years, I've started to realize that I need more focal length. For like, for example, in my Explorer Scientific 165 millimeter. As a great focal length, I can really get in deep on planetary nebula and, and, and things of that sort. What do you prefer, Chuck? I actually like using a large and wide field telescope at the same time. A lot of people like large telescopes and they think they're better, but wide field scopes can give you a great view on a large target. But I still like big bright targets to capture. I'll leave the 100 hour targets to Doug. <laughs> so Doug, when you're finished capturing an object, are you really finished with it? That's an interesting point. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that think that we just point our telescope up in the air 
take a picture and we're done, you know. But we spent hours and hours of capturing data. And then we had to do what's called pre-processing the data, where we stack all the data, bring all of the signal out from the noise floor, and actually start to see an image grow. And then we have to polish that up. I mean, there's really no magic bullet involved. There's some processes that I do in, in what a program called PixInsight, and there's a lot of stuff I do in Photoshop. And then sometimes I go back and forth. So to really get that final image, it takes hours and hours of processing the data and really teasing out that signal to get that image that we're looking for. That's right. I think people would be surprised how much work the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Telescope need before they're actually shown to the public. But there's lots of free tutorials on YouTube on how to process pictures like that. And when I'm done with my pictures, a lot of people are amazed and they actually think my pictures are from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now here's a picture of the Pillars of Creation made famous by the Hubble Space Telescope and here's my picture. I don't have the, uh, the magnification of the Hubble Space Telescope and I don't have the advantage of imaging above the Earth's atmosphere, but I'm pretty pleased with these results. Remember this scope, Doug? Yeah, that's the old AR-102 from Explorer Scientific that I used to use for solar imaging. That's right. I took this scope off Doug's hands. Astrophotography is not just a nighttime gig. I have a lot of fun capturing the sun. But remember, never look directly at the sun with the telescope. I have a lot of protection on here, like my Daystar Quark Solar Scout, and I have an energy rejection filter. But it's a lot of fun creating time lapses of what we see on the sun. I even like live streaming it and letting my YouTube subscribers watch the action. That's right, Chuck. It's fun to watch people's reactions when we post some of our work online. So be sure to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Astrobit. Well, I want to thank all of you who tuned in today to watch the 104th Global Star Party across the Great Divide. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was great to see so many people come on to the program. Uh, we're sorry that a couple of them had to drop out uh, due to extenuating circumstances. It does happen. Um, and uh, from what I understand, uh, we had a drop out somehow on Facebook. So. Uh, uh, those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, you got to see the whole program, and we thank you for that. Um, we will uh, be back next Tuesday for the 105th Global Star Party and with a new theme uh, to challenge our presenters. And, um, but tomorrow, uh, we're going to start a new program called Eclipse Experience. And our first, uh, our first episode is going to be with... Uh, with uh, Michael Zeiler and Michael Backich, who wrote this Atlas of Solar Eclipses. But these guys are real eclipse ex uh, experts. Um, 
and they're going to take you, uh, you know, they're going to guide you through uh, what you need to do to get ready for the 2023 annular eclipse and the 2024 um, total eclipse of the sun. If you go to explorescientific.com and look at the top menu, you'll see there's a new uh, featured uh, drop down menu, which is for the uh, solar eclipses. Um, this is, uh, you know, getting ready for solar eclipses can be, you know, all engrossing, all encompassing. And so we've got, uh, you know, we're already selling eclipse glasses. We have a new uh, edition of the Galileo scope coming out, which will be a solar edition. Of course, Galileo uh, was among the first people to look at the sun with the telescope. Um, you know, and uh, we, we suggest you only do that with uh, safe solar filtration. So safety is uh, a big deal. You'll see a safety video on there on, on what you should and shouldn't do with uh, solar filters. And um, uh, we invite you to uh, come to Texas Hill Country to go to the crossroads of the Eclipse's star parties. Uh, so in one spot uh, on a private ranch in Hill Country, Texas, which is just just west of uh, San Antonio, uh, in Bortle 2 skies, so it's very dark skies, um, you're going to be able to experience uh, two amazing eclipses from one place. So, uh, you know, if you come to the 2023 annular eclipse and set up, uh, it's going to be great practice for the 2024 eclipse. And so... You'll know the spot. You'll you can. Uh, I think you'll be able to request uh, to keep your very spot that you observe from in 2023. So uh, there's uh, lots of time to prepare for these eclipses now, but you do need to get started. You don't want to wait uh, a few weeks before an eclipse happens. It's uh, it's uh, you know going to be very very difficult to get the right equipment that you need. Uh, it will be difficult for you to get the practice in that you need for photographing an eclipse. So, uh, but we're going to be here to help you get that uh, going. We're going to inspire you with uh, uh, eclipse experience um, programs uh, with episode one starting tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central, not, not later at night like this one is. Um, and uh, I want to thank all the presenters that were on today. Um, uh, it was uh, wonderful to hear about the great news that most of the presenters shared with us today. Um, so, um, but we got more to share. There's more to talk about. There always is. And uh, thanks to the wonderful audience that watched us from around the world. And um, uh, for right now, I'm going to say good night. And uh, as my friend Jack Horkheimer always used to say, uh, keep looking up.